Good evening. Welcome to the Power Pod. It's a dark and stormy night again. Um, very slippy out there, very wet. Uh, I know I got soaked. What about you, On? I'm wet. As always. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's another horrible winter day. I have, yeah. I have my flame here. Uh, I have a little hot water bottle under the desk. Um, I'm, I'm fully prepared for uh, another spooky night of, uh, of Shy Talk. Nice, nice and cozy. Uh, it's all about the cozy vibes here, you know. Absolutely. Hopefully, you listener, you're uh, you're snuggled up in bed with uh, you know your best pair of headphones on, and you know you're just listening to our our sweet gentle voices as exactly. you drift off to sleep. Even though we release these at like twelve o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. They're, they're versatile. They're very versatile. Mm. Actually, that was the thing that like I like to. Talk it when Rachel was saying to us that like she was listening to one of the episodes and we were talking about something, but she like turned to like respond to us because she like was listening to us like when she was like tired or whatever, and she thought that she was like that we were in the room like talking like back in Vancouver, which I think like that's like exactly the kind of like well I don't want people to think that we're you know <laughs> right there beside them. It's a haunted but, podcast, <laughs> also. <laughs> but like that like cozy feeling. I hope that we provide that that a uh, friendship simulator. Yeah. Friendship simulator during, yeah. during uh, isolation. Yeah, it's like bus simulator, farming simulator. I want friends. to mark friendship simulator. Even though I hate <laughs> every single listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those. Uh, ever see those ads for dating simulators or uh, like Second Life sort of video games? I get them all the what time. Do, what Mark, what do you think my algorithm is just completely clogged up with? <laughs> <laughs> Just dating sims. <laughs> just dating sims. <laughs> just dating sims and how to be a human. <laughs> <laughs> how to masquerade as a human. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what have you been watching uh, this week? Oh, man. I went... Uh, right. So, I started off on... I don't know what day. I watched, like, Peeping Tom and Nightcrawler, which we'll get on to later on. But I watched uh, the new SpongeBob movie because... um. Uh, our good friend of the podcast, Liam. Uh, shout out to Liam. He does, uh, you know, par- or not, I was going to say he does Paropod. He doesn't do Paropod. We it's do Paropod. <laughs> he does uh, My Morning Coffee with Ross, which is a, a great podcast, and I recommend everyone listens to it. And he also runs a um, a movie reviewing website, uh, The Theatrical Cut, which I also recommend that you follow. But uh, I saw that he put up a review for... Um, the new uh, SpongeBob SquarePants movie, SpongeBob, the SpongeBob movie, Sponge on the Run, and um, he gave it a one out of five. And I was like, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch this because I had to. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you seen this film? No, I haven't watched. I haven't watched SpongeBob in about ten years. Any form of SpongeBob, but Fair. I'm a big, a big fan of the series. Big fan of the original movie. I think everyone is. I think everyone is. I think everyone our age is a huge fan, especially of the original film, which, um, geez, we were talking about films, films coming out like a different years, just, just a bit, uh, there. And, um, that film came out in 2004. That yeah, is back in the day. That crazy was, that was one of the, the first movies I saw in cinemas. It's also one, one the first movie I ever saw twice in cinemas. I saw it at a birthday party and then I saw it, uh, with my family. Great, yeah, I great mean, memories. That's a great, that's a fucking great film to do it to as well. Mm. Well <laughs> um, worth it. Like I couldn't believe because I because I, I so I watched like Sponge on the Run on the weekend and then I watched uh, the the original SpongeBob SquarePants movie today, and um, the original one holds up. But I couldn't fucking believe I was watching. I was like, I can't believe I was five when I saw this film. Like, <laughs> if you told me that film came out in two thousand and eight, I'd believe you. Two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah, like genuinely, it, it, it doesn't feel that. Old. It doesn't feel that. Oh, I think it's because the second film. Sponge Out of Water. That film came out like 2015, I want to say 2014. So like, it's mm. a huge gap between like the first film, and the second film. That like, I wouldn't think that the gap would have been that long. If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I just have this this idea of it as like this thing, like this relic from way like in the deep past of my <laughs> mind, my memory. Like everything associated with that film is just like I just associate like being like really small. Yeah. Ah. Back in the day, you know. I don't know how many times I've seen that film, but even like you know, I think right. I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna make this. Uh, this like discussion about Sponge on the Run. I'm gonna make it a shit sandwich, right? Oh, we're gonna start off with uh, something good, 
and then something bad, and then we're gonna end on a good note, right? Something sweet, something sour, and then something a little bit sweeter again, right? So you know, uh, sponge on their own. So I started watching this, and you know, I'd heard that it was like pretty bad from like other sources, uh, aside from uh, Liam. I'd seen like people talking about it, and um, I was start- I started watching it, and you know, the first fifteen twenty minutes. Uh, is pretty good. The animation in this film is like, at first I was like, ooh, but then I started like enjoying it more. It's this weird like three D animation. Uh, have you seen like what what this film looks like? Yeah, the CGI is uh, is disgusting. It's all like, it looks it like is... it looks slimy. Yeah, it is, but like it works as well, and like eventually, like it is like I actually don't, I don't actually don't mind the animation mm. for most of the characters. Sandy looks horrifying because they kind of, they look a little bit realistic, but Sandy looks way too hairy. It's the only way, and way too like you can see the individual hairs, mm. and it looks really fucking weird. And I didn't like that at all. But like for the most characters, it's fine. Um, and then in this one, it's King Neptune as opposed to King Poseidon. It was always and King Neptune, wasn't it? No, it's Poseidon in the in the original one. Is it? Yeah, it's Poseidon. Poseidon. Or is it Poseidon in this one? Because he always no. goes, King. Oh, he's like, oh, oh, Neptune. You know. Yeah. Oh, no, wait, I can't, I don't know. wait, is it Poseidon in this one? I think it's Poseidon. Or no, it's Neptune in this one. I'm pretty sure because they make a joke over like, they make a joke over like Greek or Roman. Yeah, um, no, they literally say, he literally goes like, oh, I'm a Greek god. I look like a Greek god. And then, he, like, his chance is like, you are a Greek god, sir. So, yeah, it's Poseidon. Oh, jeez. Oh, no, it's, yeah, no, it's Poseidon in this one and it's Neptune and, like, other stuff. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, he looks fucking weird because he looks, like, kind of humanistic. And, like, he kind of looks like a weird teenage mutant ninja turtle if he didn't have the shell kind of he looks really weird mm. um but like you know besides him and sandy i think like for the like the fish characters it looks it looks really good i like the way and like it looks really expressive and stuff like that and um they uh they used the the medium of the of the 3d animation in a way that i didn't think that they would be able to um and that's about it for uh, the, for the good part of that's this it. shit sandwich. That's all it is. <laughs> like, I was sitting there, right? And I was like, this film isn't that bad. Like, I don't know what the hate is about. Like, you know, for the first 15, 20 minutes, I was enjoying it. And then uh, they go to... Um, so the basis of this movie is uh, Gary gets uh, kidnapped. And uh, he's brought to um, Poseidon or like Neptune, whatever. He's brought to him. Because uh, Plankton takes him because Plankton wants the secret formula. And then uh, SpongeBob and Patrick go off to um, to save Gary. So it's basically the first film again. It's just like, it's just, it sounds like an episode. It just sounds like a random episode. And it, yeah, it kind yeah. That's like kind of the problem with this film is that it's an episode idea stretched across an hour and a half. Mm. Um, as well as stuff like or on in the film, which I'll get to eventually. But um. I was sitting there and I was like, kind of enjoying it. And then, you know, they got to like their first trial stage and it was, um, that they're in like a desert town and, uh, they, but they keep talking about like, Oh, this is just a dream. Like they keep talking about, Oh, this is just a dream. And I was like, well, then what's the kind of the point? If you're like, what Why is are the they point saying it's a dream? Like, <clears throat> like they literally started off with saying like, this is a dream because Patrick and SpongeBob start, start talking really cleverly about like, oh, like real f- philosophical ideas about dreaming and being alive and stuff like that. And then Patrick is like, oh, we must be dreaming because we're talking really smart. And I was just sitting there. I was like, well, then what's the point of this scene? If I already know that this is a dream, like what is the mm. point in this? And then, so they get to the town. And um, they go inside the... Oh, then you meet uh, Keanu Reeves, the sage. Who's he play? He plays a tumbleweed. Oh, okay. A tumbleweed. With, his, with like, Keanu Reeves' face in the tumbleweed. Is he like... Is that CGI? Or is that just no, his no, face? No, no. It's, it's like... It's, it's, it's his face. It's like like the Teletubbies like, son thing? Yes, exactly. Like the, Yes. That's fucked but he's up. Not like, he's not even like glowing or anything. It's it's literally like his skin tone with like a hate, like a kind of like orange hue around it to like merge into the tumbleweed. That's horrible. Um, it doesn't like because the animation is like so weird. It actually 
fits in stylistically, which is a mm. miracle. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't. Like, say, I don't know how whoever got that to work should be is the real star of this movie. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Based on what I, yeah, you're genuinely. Um, that sounds ridiculous. But it's only it's only Keanu Reeves because there's humans in this, and like SpongeBob and Patrick don't mesh with them at all, right? Mm. Um, and so they go to like the saloon, and so this is like a fucking deserted like uh cowboy town or whatever and uh, they go into uh the saloon and then zombie pirate cowboys show up and i was like okay you know that's a bit weird it's a bit like, I, was, I was actually kind of enjoying it. it's like that's so fucking bizarre because the second film is so fucking weird and so like absurd in a lot of ways that like, i was like okay yeah sure whatever and then um something happens and they line up and i was like oh they're gonna start singing and dancing and then snoop dog appears and snoop dog starts rapping and they all start dancing and then spongebob and patrick start doing the thriller and i was just sitting there and i was just like what am i doing <laughs> why, why am i watching this oh god how long <laughs> and, is this movie an hour and a half an hour, that's this is- all right i suppose now, that would be okay if it wasn't 45 minutes. So this scene happens at, like, the 30-minute mark. And then Danny Trejo shows up to be, like, the big bad zombie. And then he dies within, like, three minutes of being on screen. And then it's over and done with. And that's it. That's the only challenge that they go against. Mm. And it's in a dream. So they so realistically, they don't go... Because, you know, in the original film, you know, they first go to uh, the bar. And then they, they go to the... Yeah, they, like, the, they goofer, the, the goofy... Go, the weenie trials. The weenie trials. There was like a, to the weenie trials. There was like a coherent sort of pattern to it, you know? There was a real sort of arc. Yeah, and then they go to the fucking fish. And then they have to go into the trench. And then they have the to trench face... Is the uh, best. The the ach the um not the the cy- the cyclops, the cyclops and shell city yeah. shell city like they're all iconic. The trench is is great. The yeah, now that we're man, now that we're man, love it. And even a bit beforehand, where like they're just sitting on the cliff edge, and like the giant like monster yeah. uh, fish takes it, and their face their facial reaction afterwards is so funny. Mm-hmm. But like so, this film so like uh, supposed to the run. I thought that the film was gonna be like that, and it's like that's a bit lazy, but sure, whatever. No, like so they're so they're after the dream sequence, they get to like the lost city of Atlantis, which is where they're trying to go. So forty five minutes into this film, and you're already where you're meant to be, and then there's like a five minute montage of them just being like, cause like uh, Atlantis City is like um is like uh, Vegas, so they have like a Vegas montage. And then they get like drunk, basically, and they fall asleep. And they they gamble and stuff like that. And they get loads of money, and then they lose overnight. And they have like an entourage and stuff like that. Whoa. And then they go in. So this is so then like fifteen minutes. So like at the hour mark, they try and get Gary, and then they're thrown in jail. And then five minutes later, they're on trial, and Sandy and Squidward and Mr. Krabs and Plankton show up. Why? Like, How? Because they're just like, they see on the screen on uh, back in the ki- the bikini bottom that like Patrick and uh, SpongeBob are on trial, so they're like, oh, we gotta go and save them because they're gonna be executed for trying they're to gonna, steal. They're gonna be executed. They're gonna be executed. They literally <laughs> said they're gonna be executed. <laughs> they're literally like, well, they're like, oh, come down on Friday to the last city of Atlantis's uh, public execution of what? Patrick Star and SpongeBob because pa- it's like Patrick a fucking... gets the chair and they stick the sponge SpongeBob on top of him to like. <laughs> it's part of the execution oh, yeah, process. The green mile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The green mile but it's in SpongeBob. <laughs> the Sponge Mile. That's that's the fourth film. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's already in development. But uh and then this is now so uh, like you said earlier that like, you know, this film this film sounds like an 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 episode and it is like an episode. And then you realize that it's an episode along with a uh, an advertisement for the spin-off that they're making because at a certain point in this film like when they're all on trial when Spongebob and Patrick are on trial it's Sandy and Mr. Krabs and Squidward and Patrick to defend Spongebob on trial they just tell the audience and uh, you know Poseidon and like the trial or whatever about the first time that they met Spongebob which is apparently a TV show that's going to be made called uh, Camp Coral mm, and I heard the the creator of uh, SpongeBob, uh, Tom Hiddleston, is that his name? 
Tom Hiddleston. No. Uh, Steven, no. Steven Hellenberg, I think. Hiddleston? Oh, jeez, I got that wrong completely. <laughs> <laughs> please. Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston, he's the actor, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's the actor. <laughs> I don't know, I think I'm ta- Tim Dillon is the writer and director of this film, I think. Tim Dillon, yeah. is it? Yeah, Tim Dillon. comedian Dillon, yeah. or just some random guy? Some random guy. It's oh. not the, it's not... Well, maybe oh, he's Tim, a comedian. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, but anyway, the, so they... Like the the creator of SpongeBob. Oh, this is the guy who did uh, Garfield Two, A Tale of Two Kitties, and all oh that my stuff. God, Alvin that and the makes Chipmunks. So much sense. Uh, and Muppets from Space, which I can't remember. That makes but, so much sense. Yeah. Actually, Muppets Muppets from Space. That's the one where they get Gonzo and he's an alien. I remember that film. That film was pretty decent when I was younger. Um, but uh, like apparently, like uh, Steve, uh, whatever his name is, his uh, his like dying wish. <laughs> Was for them to Kansas not make her... <laughs> no, it was for them to not make a spin off of SpongeBob. Mm, yeah. And then Nickelodeon just waited for him to die and they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, he died. Can't believe he died. I know. Man. He did last year, wasn't it? Or the it was a few years ago, yeah. I think That's it was so just sad. as they were releasing the last one, like the second movie. That film was so weird. Mm, I haven't seen it. Is it. That's like that's mixed animation CGI, isn't it? Is this full CGI? Yeah, this is full CGI. So, like, the second one is like mostly. Like 2D animation, and mm. then at the end, for like the last bit, it's like 3D animation. But the apparently, like the trailer made it seem like it was all 3D animation, but it's not that at all. It's just it's majority 2D animation, but this film is all 3D. So like, the issues with this film is that like it's so all over the place, and it's just fucking boring. Like nothing happens, mm. and it's not fucking funny. Like. I went back today to like just see how long each like each segment takes. The trial scene of them talking about like oh like SpongeBob this he's my best friend and this is where I saw him and stuff like that. And it's it has nothing to do with the film. The entire point of that scene is to be mm. the uh, introduction to Camp Coral. That literally takes up ten minutes, and then them like persuading or uh, persuading Poseidon to uh, not take Gary back takes five minutes or seven minutes, and then it's the end of the film. And the music in this film is fucking awful. There's a cover <laughs> of by Weezer of Take On Me. And it is the worst thing I have ever that's, fucking heard. That's a cursed combination. Absolutely cursed. It's from that really bad Weezer album where they just did a load of covers. Oh, really? And they did a... Uh, I think because they did like... we Didn't Weezer do a version of... Um, uh, Toto's Africa and it was like... It, yeah, it was like, yeah. Uh, uh, they made an album based on the success of that song and it was fucking dog shit mm. and take on me is fucking awful all the music in this film is awful yeah it's such a letdown because the spongebob movie soundtrack was a defining soundtrack of my uh of my early existence so uh, an amazing soundtrack great stuff from uh the shins flame and lips uh ween and like all, all the songs are pretty good and they have a few mm-hmm. even the joke songs are, are like funny um, oh yeah man that film because i watched that film today now here's the second here's the the nice bit that film's great that film is so funny it holds and, yeah. up so well it was written that, that was the last one they did before um steve hillenberg uh dropped off uh spongebob mm. like he quit apparently after it was meant to be the like the end of spongebob like this was meant to be the last spongebob thing yeah because it ends with him being a manager so it makes sense mm. it's like this is the last bit. yeah how did they explain that in the series like they did i never it doesn't watched. exist huh? it doesn't exist this film doesn't exist in the tv show what does it yeah. not? No. What? Uh, I, yeah. I don't think I watched the series after this, though. Like, because I, I remember it used to, like, I'd still watch SpongeBob even th- up to today if I saw it on TV. Or I'd flick onto it. But, like, you know the way, it's the same with The Simpsons as well. You flick onto it and you see the animation style. Mm, and you can tell know. straight away if this is good or not. And, like, most of the times, Nick wasn't showing the, uh, they didn't show the, uh, the good ones unless it was really late at night. So I, yeah. I stopped watching SpongeBob probably, like, after they start introducing all those new new episodes, yeah, I think like once you once it gets up to like the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, that's like that's when it starts to get bad, and it was meant to be like the end of SpongeBob. But you know, I think SpongeBob is probably Nickelodeon's biggest brand, so mm. they're not, so they were never gonna let it die. And he like uh, Steve, whatever his name is, I actually probably should look up his name, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> 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 he yeah, uh, he he like Steve he Hillenberg, left. rest in peace. Rest Steve in peace. Hillenberg, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Steve Hillenberg, rest in peace, King. Uh, he didn't. He he stepped away from it. Mm. So like, and it makes sense. Like when you're watching it, like it makes so much sense. But then like because it's not the end. I think pretty sure like every. Oh man, I just realized something. Like what? every SpongeBob SquarePants movie is non-canon except for this one because it sets up 
Cam Coral, mm. which is now going to be canonically part of the SpongeBob movie, which apparently like that like in like SpongeBob like like uh, Steve Hillenburg's SpongeBob, there's like episodes that like explain how Patrick and SpongeBob met and how Patrick met or how SpongeBob met uh, Squidward and Sandy and whatever, mm. and this retcons all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, fuck the canon, man. Like, who cares? But it's like people are gonna. Me, I care about the SpongeBob canon. The SpongeBob lore, the SpongeBob canon. Who's keeping track of this? Like Nickelodeon have SpongeBob historians like on the on the books, you know, writing everything down. I don't know. I'm telling you, there's, a, there's definitely a YouTuber that does that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the worst part about this is the young, the younger generation are going to be ruined because they'll be like, mm. they'll, they'll only their perception of SpongeBob will be uh, Cam Coral and like shot like this, like this yeah. movie. Oh man, you know? and like watch because like I was, I forgot um, the uh, the Hitman in like fucking in in the SpongeBob movie like Dennis, Dennis voiced yeah. voiced by Alec Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That movie had low like. David Hasselhoff shows up. It's so funny. I like I forgot that he that he was in it. Uh-huh. And I was just watching it, I was like, this film is like such a great setup. And then it's just, it just throws in like a hitman that's coming after them. Mm. And it's like the stakes are like so are so high. <laughs> mm. Like they're so well set up and like uh like the tension and like the pushing force, it's so well done. Mm. And like there's a point where you know like SpongeBob fucking fails, he doesn't win, and then he busts out I'm a goofy goober and fucking rocks out and he saves the day. Yeah. <laughs> or the part where they die on the in the in Shell City. Like That bit's so that's, sad. That's like well, I, I was a kid when I watched it, but I was like, they're gone, like, you know? Man, he is, cause like, he, th- no, 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 watching it today, man, that scene is so fucking yeah, sad. Yeah, yeah, because it's just two best friends lying there, bleached in the sun, you know, been through so much. They came all this way, and they failed. And, like, for a moment, you're like, oh, God. Even if you know things, like, the movie hasn't ended, you're like, oh, my God, like, things have gone wrong. Imagine if someone edited this film and just cut it off there. <laughs> and just left, <laughs> with the, left with the, the last <laughs> the, the heart shaped here and just like puts <laughs> the credit. It just leaves it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do that and just pretend like every other thing of SpongeBob never happened. Or we could just do yeah. that with the actual movie. <laughs> just kill him. Yeah, just yeah. Kill him. Just kill him off. But like uh, that scene is so sad as well because like they're sitting there and they're like they're so upset because they're like, oh, we didn't even make it. And then they realized, oh, no, wait, we did make it to Shell City. And they're like, they're going to die happy because it's like, well, happier, I guess, because mm. they still failed. But they're still like, oh, we did what people said that we couldn't do. And but we're the only ones that are going to know that we did it. Yeah. But we but we know that we made it. Which here. is all that matters. We know that know. we which all which is all that matters. Yeah. And there's a great bit at the end where like um, Mr. Krabs is like Squidward, get over here. And uh, I think we all know who deserves the manager position. And Squid was like, oh, of course we do. And uh, Sponzo was like, wait, hold on, everyone. I need to say something. Mm. And <laughs> Squidward is like, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say the thing that you thought you wanted is not what you wanted all What is not what you turned out. Is not what turned out to be what you wanted all along. But what you really wanted was what was down deep inside of you. And Sponzo was like, are you kidding me? And he just snatches it out of his hand. And it's like, I was going to tell you that your fly is down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it cuts, <laughs> and it's just like, cuts the and ocean it just man. Cuts, and it's just like, it's such a great fucking ending. Because it's yeah. like, yeah, that would be such a cliched ending. But no, he wanted to be fucking manager. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's great. It's such a great show. It's such a great oh, movie. It's, so, it's such, I, like, I think in my head, I'm just going to canonically like, just remove everything that came out after this film. Yeah. Because like, the, fir- the first film is genuinely fantastic. Like It gets critiques now because it doesn't... Um, For it what? From out, where? Because like, it leaves out like all the side characters. Because the side characters like Sandy. Sandy's not in this film Sandy's at all. Uh, in the first <clears throat> one. In the fir- first film, Sandy, really sh- Sandy was always a shy character. I was, that's that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> I thought I always thought she was just annoying, except for that one episode where like SpongeBob needs water, water. That's a great. Episode. That's a great episode. And She's the karate great one now. or the karate, the karate one. one. Yeah. But I, I always one thought she was just annoying. And uh, Squidward is. Oh really- man, you need to watch Sponge the Run. She's awful. Oh god, uh, Squidward. It, it could have used more Squidward, but I don't know. Um, like, what are the side characters? Are there like Mrs. Puff? Fucking. She's not. She does not exist. The guy who goes, my leg. He's not really he's in. Actually, he's actually, he says my eyes in this twice. Oh, he does actually. Yeah. He yeah. has more lines than Mrs. Puff. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Puff doesn't say anything in this film. He's iconic though. He's iconic. Yeah, he is. But like that, I think like if I had like ten more minutes of just having those characters in it, it would have like it wouldn't be critique. It'd be a perfect film. <laughs> mm. 
definitely. But I think like just because of that, like it doesn't, it doesn't have any of the side characters. Like it is just SpongeBob and Patrick, and you know Mr. Krabs basically. Yeah. And Plankton. Plankton is great in this film as well. Like he's like, in like in the new one, he like causes this to happen. And then feels bad about it because he's like, "Oh shit, Mr. Krabs just like gives him the uh, gives him the formula because like SpongeBob has gone off to Atlanta City, and he's just like he realizes that he needs him, and like he's like, ah, oh, it's all pointless if you don't have SpongeBob." Mm. Um, which actually turns out that like they actually they name what the secret formula is in this film. Oh, it's f- what? It's no. friendship. Friendship all along was the secret formula, Mark. That's that is terrible. Yeah. That is awful. Yeah. It's like, that's the whole point of the joke. You're not supposed to say it. But are they doing it? Is that like a joke? No, they do it in song and dance. Oh my God. This film should be burned. Should be like completely. When did this come out again? This year. Not like before lockdown? No, it came out like a, it came out like a week ago. Uh, hopefully. I would encourage everyone. I haven't watched this, but I encourage everyone listening to, to this. Boycott this to film. boycott this movie and boycott Nickelodeon. And. You know, if you can write into uh, whoever directed this movie, that's uh, that's just like defeats the purpose. Yeah, oh, it's just so against the spirit. But or like, is it? I don't know. But like, no, it that's, is. That's it is against stupid. the spirit. Like, it's against that's fucking stupid. everything. Like, I know that they, like um, and like episodes beforehand that it's like, remember that episode where like he's facing off with like Neptune, and he like it's who can make the most Krabby Patties, and SpongeBob makes one Krabby Patty that takes like Neptune the time to make like thousands. But because you put so much care and love into it, it tastes way better. And, like, that's the real whole thing why. Like, yeah. I get, like, the love and thing. But, like, that was kind of a joke in that episode. But this film canonically says that, like, <laughs> <laughs> love and friendship is what makes this pa- makes these food so good. Silly. Which makes no sense considering that Mr. Krabs is a capitalist pig. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point. The- Mr. Krabs is, like, almost villainous, you know? Oh, it's just Yeah, friendship. Where's the friendship? Squidward hates SpongeBob, you know, like... It's like a love hate thing, but like oh no! In this one, in this one, he says he doesn't actually hate SpongeBob. He's like he's annoying, but I love him. Like he says that. Yeah, well, that's always been the thing. But like, there's not like it's not. But like, like, you don't like, need to say great it. Team. Yeah, you don't. You don't have to say it. Like that's just stupid. That's a, that's just that's just silly. That's just. But silly. like plant, so like plant and like feels remorse because of how easy it was to get the formula and stuff like that, and like he feels bad about like SpongeBob going to be executed. Meanwhile, yeah, in the original film. In the me- meanwhile, he sends Patrick and SpongeBob to go get killed, and sends a hitman after them to make sure that they die, mm. and is sitting there waiting for Mr. Krabs to be executed. Like Planton is evil in this film. Yeah, he's bad. He's and he, bad he takes the over person. the he takes over the entire bikini bottom and has like the buckets that like mind control them. Yeah, he takes yeah. over the world. <laughs> yeah, he tries to take over the world. You know, uh, for some reason. In the 2020 film, if he if he just stayed where he was he would have succeeded what and he wouldn't he would he because he won basically but then he's like oh i feel real bad about winning that's stupid. let's go let's do this for another 20 years mr Krabs. eh? <laughs> yeah it's like joker and batman mm. it's like i need you like imagine joker just be like oh, i feel really bad batman i'm gonna let you go <laughs> <laughs> that'd be some sort of joss weed and batman or something jesus yeah, i would but um <laughs> yeah, re- remember uh remember scarlett johansson's in the first one as well She's the the mermaid. Oh yes, such a star-studded cast. Because I was listening to it, and I was like, "That's someone," but I yeah. don't know who it is. She's such a distinct, Excuse distinct me. voice. Very nice. Yeah, very pleasant voice. Who plays? Or a fucking um. Actually, you know, uh, Arrested Development. Mm. The uh, the dad in Arrested Development plays uh, Neptune. Neptune yeah, in this. Yeah. yeah. What's his name again? I can't remember. No idea. But he's can't he's remember. a very funny guy. He's so good, yeah. and he's great in this as well. Uh-huh. With the ball spot, he's like, "It's fading, <laughs> <laughs> fading, fading." <laughs> but there's loads of like adult jokes in this as well. Mm. Like, there's a bit where like, um, ah, uh, can't. This is the only thing that's coming off the top of my head. But like, there's a bit where like, plant and opens up his like his evil plan, and then it folds down as if it's like a Playboy magazine, and he's like, "Oh, oh." Oh, yeah, I like yeah, yeah. I like only I remember watching it as a kid and not knowing what that was, but now watching it now, I'm like oh yeah, that's what, that's what, like there's jokes in it that are for adults. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the key to a good good animation or good kids. Meanwhile, movie. in Sponge on the Run, fucking Just Keanu Reeves, 
Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Actually, I noticed that like in SpongeBob films, they love to show like really detailed uh, images of like uh, of the characters' <laughs> asses. Yeah, like <laughs> like Planted <laughs> is thick for one scene in yeah. like Sponge on the Run. <laughs> uh, you know that part in the SpongeBob movie where. Uh... Patrick comes down from the ceiling and he's wearing those stilettos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh no, I thought you were gonna say with the flag up in his ass. Oh yeah, like, yeah. There's so, the so many the weird film. parts in that movie. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of asses in this film. Yeah. Well, that's funny though. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. It's all uh, it's all guy asses though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is SpongeBob. Yeah, there's definitely something going on with uh, the whole thing. Like, mm-hmm. how is Mister How is Mister Krabs' daughter a whale? Like, none of, none of it makes any sense, you know? You know. You know how it'd be. You know how it'd be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that what I've been watching. <laughs> what you been watching this week? <laughs> uh, I watched Born Ultimatum. A great movie. Yeah, I, I think I think half an hour <clears throat> is enough for Spongebob. That's a half yeah. hour segment for Spongebob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> time, to, time to move on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be uh, fair, it was two films. <laughs> very true. Two great movies. No, um, one great movie and one terrible film. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, I watched Born Ultimatum. I watched it like on Friday, I think. Very good movie. It's just returning to it. One of those movies that you can always rewatch. I don't usually rewatch movies. Very mm, rarely. Neither. But this is uh this is one of those things that like it just works. It just it's very self contained and if you know the story it's even better. And uh the ending is just like like it's just Jason Bourne doing his thing. He's like the best action movies all i can think of like right now like they're so uh like, like they're really john exci- wick maybe john wick i've never seen john only, wick so i've only seen oh sorry raid one and two raid one and two are the best yeah. modern i have uh, action films i haven't seen them now oh well, like john wick uh i've never seen that either but also seen john wick seems one. sort of like sort of funny as well and seems like more light-hearted whereas jason bourne is like it's not just an action movie it's also like a conspiracy thriller and there's like yeah. there's a uh, one thing i noticed when i was watching it there during the week was uh, how much how much comes up that uh, like this was released in 2007 I think uh, how much comes up that was then like in the, the few years after that like verified as a real thing that actually happened within like the state oh, like department Snowden and stuff like that yeah like the, 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 the villains in the movie or in the series are the NSA and in the movie they're shown as like they can track down phone calls within seconds and they can find out what you're gonna like the, uh, one of the lines from uh, the bad guy is uh, I want to know what he's doing before he does, and like that's basically what the NSA Snowden, does, like, like yeah. what, like how, like uh, the data economy works, and that's what, yeah, like the whole prism, the prism leaks by Snowden revealed this whole apparatus that is basically just what the Bourne movies are about, but like they're portrayed yeah, as, yeah, as a yeah. conspiracy, and then it's all set against like this sort of action, this this like really intense action backdrop. Yeah, they're like, we're super major black ops. No one knows about us. We're undercover. And then, like, fucking Snowden's just like, oh, actually, these guys actually do exist. <laughs> yeah, well, they were black ops. They are yeah. undercover. And people were like, this can't be real. This is just a conspiracy. And then Snowden was like, actually, yes, it is real. And basically, it's actually worse than it is portrayed in the movies. And we just sort of got along with it. Like, there probably are people like Jason Bourne who had their identities. In fact, there definitely are people who had their, like, identities erased and were like trained as killers mm. like there's a plot device in the movie where uh, like no matter where uh jason Bourne goes it's set across like half a dozen cities across europe and no matter where he goes the nsa always have an asset like a, a trained killer who's just lying in wait like waiting to be activated in the city yeah it's true that's the same thing in the first two as well um, they're literally like in the second film going they're about to go because it's uh, it's like in berlin the second one they're literally like oh where's he going it's like oh berlin's like oh where like who's our assets in berlin like they they're just like they're literally just like oh yeah whoever we have in berlin get them on get them on the yeah, case basically. the asset yeah who's on in berlin um but like as i was saying i was watching with orla i was like there's definitely there's a person here in dublin right now that mm. is an asset waiting to be activated <laughs> by i don't know like the nsa there's like little conspiracy thought but it, it is probably true like it, it almost certainly is true. Right, they got the sh- they have the fucking Shannon Airport. You know the the U.S. military still use this. They got this place on lockdown they before st- there was a yeah. lockdown. They they st- they have got assets here. So yeah, of course they got they got like some fucking top fucking agent that's like somewhere in Ireland that can just kill everyone in Ireland <laughs> at the drop of Activate a hat. Yes, it definitely gonna happen. But uh, great movies, great movies. The mm. chase scenes are amazing. 
Chasey are very good. phenomenal. 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 <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> They're very good. And uh it was it was uh, directed by this guy Paul Greengrass who like I think he only really did the Bourne movies, but his whole shtick is like fast cuts and mm. uh, like really confusing sort of cinematography, but like with context in the movie. Like there's a scene in, in Bourne Ultimatum where he's fighting the asset in um I think it's Tangier or something. And uh, it's across like several rooftops and it's like into an apartment. It's about 10 minutes long. It's really intense. I remember uh, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it ends up in a bathroom and it's just, it's like hand on hand uh, combat between Jason Bourne and uh, the asset. And it's like, you don't know what's going on, but you know that like something, you know, it's really intense. And yeah. uh, there's like fists flying everywhere and you, you don't know who's going to win. And it's, it's just like really good action. Very good action. There's some of those ones that work really well in the Bourne films. Like in the first film, the action is, it is that fast call, but it's clear who's winning and like who's hitting who. There's one fight in uh, in Born Supreme, yes, yeah, Born Supremacy, where he's in Berlin and he's fighting the asset there, and he's in his gaff, and you literally can't tell what's happening because it's cutting so fast. Mm. Like that's like sometimes I think like it works in these films and then sometimes it just doesn't work. I think that the thing in that one is that it was taking place in a really confined space. Yeah, yeah. So like when it's when it's when it's in a confined space like like in one room of a house, it can like I'm pretty sure like it, there's like 30 there's like fucking like not 30 cuts, but like it feels like there's like 30 cuts from the time that they're like fighting over like a coffee table and fall down on top of the coffee table and like there's so many cuts in that that you can't see what's actually happening and i think like mm. in a confined space like that it doesn't really work but in that scene that you're talking about like they're going from like different buildings so like there's there's a movement within like the confined spaces which makes it more easy to read mm, yeah oh plus it's like it's in a space where like they, could, they couldn't swing a cat you know so like of course you're not gonna know even if you're in that if you're in Jason Bourne's position you're not gonna really know what's going on. You're not uh, even so, gonna know if you're winning. <laughs> yeah, you're just gonna be like, ah, oh, you know, and uh, it sort of it betrays it really well. And just the way he does it is like he's such a badass. He's such a like a. Oh, he's, such he's, a he's so badass. cool. He's so cool. I don't know what it is. He's just a cool guy. I and, love uh, like in Bourne's Supremacy. There's a bit where like they, there's a bit where like he's like uh, he's on the phone to someone. And this is like the main bad guy. Base well, the main she she seems to be the main bad guy. She's not actually the bad, main bad guy, but she's um she's like trying to find Bourne, and she's like she's like thinking that she knows exactly what's going on, and she's kind of underestimating like how much of a fucking king, killer, how much of a king he is, <laughs> and how much of a like a uh, like a killer that he is. Mm. And she's on the phone with him, and she's just like uh. He's like, oh, talk to, like, John or whatever. And she's like, oh, I can't get through to him. And, like, he's... But he's there with a sniper looking at her. And he's just like, he's right beside you. And that's the <laughs> moment that she realizes that he's actually... he's uh, He can kill her right now. And she's completely under underestimated how efficient yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a scene in this one where he's, like, communicating with the uh, the woman. I can't... I don't know her role, but, like, she's, like, below the main bad guy. And she's it like, might be the same woman. It in, might be the same in, woman, yeah. It might be. And she's, uh, it might be the same scene. It's like he's like across the the way, uh, across the street from her office, and he's talking to her, and he's like, she's trying to make an offer to him. That's the end of the first one of the second one. So it might be, the yeah, start be of this similar. film. But basically, he's like, he's talking to them, and they get faked out, and then suddenly he's he's inside the office of the director of the NSA or something. And oh he's no, taking that's all a the documents, scene. and they're like, they're like, oh my god, I can't believe it, Jason Bourne has done it again. And uh, the way just, that they do that in those films <laughs> is so good. Yeah, the way it's it, so good. <laughs> it just happens again and again. They're just like, "How did this happen?" <laughs> and the, you know the do you know the ending of the Born Ultimatum, the ending scene. It like ends how it starts, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember how it starts. Like the the movie or the series. The whole series, he like falls in the water. Yeah, it is. That's yeah. it. Yeah, he falls in the water. He jumps off a building and falls in the water. Uh, but he he repeats the line from. Um, that Clive Owen says in the first one, he's like talking to this guy to uh, another like a uh, another asset, and this mm. is a guy who he's like he'd spared earlier in the movie when he crashed his car, he didn't shoot him, and uh, the the asset asks like oh why why didn't you shoot why didn't you take the shot and he's like he's like look at us, do you even know why you're supposed to kill me, look what they make you give it's like ah oh, it's all coming full circle and then he fa- then he falls into the water and he's like it cuts to the news reports the next day it's like. Uh, the director has been like arrested or whatever like it all sort of ties up 
and it's your one um the girl who'd been helping him through i think the second or the third one uh she's like watching from a cafe and uh the, the news report just ends with jason Bourne was uh, is missing for the past three days and it's like it cuts to like you know the the theme song great theme song by the way extreme mm-hmm. ways it cuts to that it's like the greatest ending ever they do say like, like that like progression of born is so fucking good because in because i think that like <clears throat> that progression only really started in the second one because i don't think that they knew that this film's like the original one was going to be part of a trilogy mm. and then well actually you know, they're part of books so actually maybe yeah rob ludlum maybe they Big did man. no but but i mean but that progression like the idea of him not killing everyone starts in the second film because the girl that he's with in the first film is killed in the second one mm-hmm. and like he's like he's like all fucked up about it and he doesn't again like he doesn't uh, take the final shot to kill the main assassin that's after him in the second film who kills his girlfriend mm-hmm. but like that's like progression of like He's like, he's trying to, he's like that, I try to get out, but they pull me right back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he's like, he's a, he's moral, you know. But the, at the end of the day, he's like, he's so like depoliticized. Like he doesn't have any political motivations. He just wants to find no. out who he is and his backstory. Like even... Uh, he just wants to be left the fuck alone mostly. Yeah, he, just, <laughs> he, he basically just wants to be left alone. Like he doesn't want to take anything. He's not a threat to the, to the, uh, the state and he makes that clear to them. He's like, I don't want, I don't want to make any trouble here. I just want to know. I just want to find out like who I actually am before mm. you just erase my memories and like train me as a, like a, a contract killer or whatever. And they're like, you can't do that, man. It's like yeah, you're you you're signed up, bro. Yeah, you signed up. To, you, you signed the contract, bro. It's like, uh, like I know the, um, the you know, like electroconvulsive therapy. Mm-hmm. Like that's how that's basically what they did to him. Like that's actually a real thing. Like where yeah. they they charge you with electric shocks and like erase your memories. And like uh, keep you up for days, and then like cycle it with feeding you loads of sleeping pills. And they, uh, I was reading this thing where they, uh, they used to stick cardboard boxes on your limbs, so that you'd have no sense of self, so you wouldn't be able to touch like your body, and you wouldn't be able to look in mirrors. Oh, so you'd yeah, lose. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, you'd lose your sense of like personality and your sense of self. You literally like disassociate. Yeah, yeah, like permanently. And like, it was a That's real thing. So fucked up. So that's basically what they did to him, and he's just like, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to find out what happened before, you know. Yeah, I just want to find like, out no. the, the backstory. They're like, nah. Yeah, especially like in the second one, they're talking about like one of the characters is like the one that has to like look after all like all their agents' well being and stuff like that. Mm. And it's like, oh yeah, how do they all do? And like she's just listing off like all the issues that they had. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, PTSD. You know, they had this, they had this anxiety, depression, um flashbacks like all, everything and then there's like oh ever get someone has amnesia and she's like well you know i haven't seen one but i'm pretty sure that that can't happen over the mental strain that we put them under and they just say it's like <laughs> so they're just like yeah this could probably happen with like how yeah. badly we fucked them up <laughs> yeah they're all fucked up that's about that's about it yeah. yeah and that's the best thing as well like like born is not alone in this like clive Owen in the first one he's fucked up because of this as well mm. they're all fucked up from it but it's just like where in the in the progress of being fucked up are you mm. and like what like stick because you're eventually you're because everyone in this is going to be a, like in this program will eventually turn out to be a clive own or, or turn out to be a born it just it matters on where in the cycle that you are <laughs> yeah what point you break you which know? is cool it's a cool point it's just like because that's like also it is like he doesn't he doesn't resent the other fucking uh assassins and stuff like that because he was like them as well. He's just like, oh, man, you're just going to wake up, open your eyes, take yeah, off yeah. the... <laughs> you got to get out of this game, bro. This is this is a bad idea. I'm telling you. And they're all just like, why didn't you take the shot? Yeah, they're all just like robots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... um Great movie. Great movie. They're great. All three of them are great. Just all three great. of the films are great. Now, two after that. I haven't seen them, but I'm Born sure Legacy, they're Legacy, Jason Bourne, two terrible movies. Bourne Legacy in particular is so bad Jeremy Renner as Jason Bourne or as like a different version of Jason Bourne it's just terrible it just yeah. should not have been made are they they're not directed by the same guy are they uh, Jason Bourne is directed by Paul Greengrass that's Jesus. why that's why Matt Damon came back because he, he, he'd only come back on the condition that the original guy would direct it and they agreed yeah. on it and they both made a pile of shite absolute waste of time waste of my time waste of everyone's money uh, they shouldn't have done it and they want to make a sixth one bad idea don't do it that's a terrible idea. If you're listening, Matt, don't do it. 
I'm pretty sure that like um the um born identity was like the thing that like broke uh, Matt Damon out of like being uh, like the goodwill hunting type of actor and stuff like that. Mm. I'm pretty sure it's the first time that people are like, oh shit, Matt Damon can play a fucking badass. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what else he, he, he was in he, before that, really. Because he I played was, like, he's in Green Zone as well, which is like very similar to this as well. Ah, that was like 20, 2011, like. That was very recent. Uh, it was like, yeah, it was like 2009, 2010. It was mm. only a few years after Ultimate. It was shy as well. I mean, I've never seen it. I saw a couple of clips of it. it I remember it cool. being on Sky Premiere and watching it. I was like, that looks shite. <laughs> it is. It's terrible. Do you want to uh, introduce the uh, film recommendation from uh, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. Episode 11. So the film recommendations this week were Peeping Tom and Nightcrawler. Two very compelling movies. We discussed peeping tom briefly a few episodes ago um we did we didn't go fully in depth uh you hadn't seen it on so we could probably start there with peeping tom uh, what, what do you what, what was your impression of the movie um so i remember was it two or three weeks ago you said that um peeping tom was like one you know one of the best films you've ever seen yeah for sure stand by that I, I agree man it is amazing it's crazy it's so good it's so good um I wasn't expecting it to look as good as it did. Yeah, it's a really particular type of uh, type of film. I think uh, Martin Scorsese's talked about it a lot. It's like Eastman color. Um, mm. It's almost like I think we discussed like Spring Breakers. I think it was last episode or something. It's like really, the, really yeah, br- the two, two weeks ago. Yeah, it's like it's like eating candy. It's like every color pops, and yeah. it's like really bright reds and like just bright colors in general. It's really uh, stimulating to watch. Yeah, like the blues, or not even like the blues. It's the like, the like reds and purples that are in this film, and the blues are fucking beautiful. Like it's like that neon style kind of that's like around now. But like, like this film is even this film is older than like uh, Suspiria, which I think is like you know, one of the first films to do that neon style and get like you know lots of recognition for it. But this film does it like. I think like 10 years beforehand or something crazy like that. But yeah, it's a fucking like in the in terms of like filmmaking techniques. It's incredible. Like where is it? Where is the, the fella um, that played Mark? Where is he from? I don't know. He looks German though. And he sounded kind of German, but I think he's, he's English. I think like, he's English. He's one of those know, old he, style It's an all English, English uh, cast. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very English movie. They all talk really proper and all. And um mm. It's like even like Mark's a landlord. It's like he's he. I wasn't expecting that. He's minted. <laughs> yeah, he is rich, which also sort of ties back. Sort of ties into his uh his disposition, his uh his sort of pathology. You know, mm. like the same way. Uh, or no, M- Mubi had a, a pretty interesting video essay that I just saw there recently. It was uh, called Psycho Tom. It compares uh, compares Psycho to Peeping Tom in like a video essay format. And uh, Peeping Tom is better, I think. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think Peeping Tom is way better, which is sort of weird because people don't like. I hadn't heard about it. Really. I'd heard about it, but I didn't. People don't talk about it, and it's 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 never shown anywhere. I think like there's bits in fucking uh, in Psycho that have not aged well. Like there's bits where like the special effects, are, like because I watched this uh, during like, like lockdown, so it's fresh in my mind. There's like shots of like characters. There's a shot of a character falling down the stairs, and it looks fucking shit. And there's the end of the film is pretty fucking transphobic and it's not great. Hasn't aged too well. But Peeping Tom will only age better, I think. It'll only get more love because of what it's talking about. Yeah, it's much more uh, much more of a general movie. Plus it's like it's uh, really ahead of its time in terms of how it approaches what it's talking about. So it's like it's about images. And the cult of the image, basically, and the spectacle. But this is like this is 1960. This is before Guy Debord, all the guys like that, mm-hmm. like talking about uh, how images and uh, sort of media has taken over uh, social relations. There's even uh, there's an essay I was reading there earlier today, which is uh, I think it's I can't remember the name of it actually. Uh, it sort of talks about 
uh, film in like a Freudian perspective. Like this is sort of before people talked about film as seriously as it, or yeah. or related topics this sort of complex back to film. But it's not it's not trying to sort of bridge that gap. It just naturally does it. It's like a really sort of simplistic and uh, or not simplistic, just like a simple and like really accessible way to talk about pretty complex ideas. Yeah, a hundred percent. Especially like you mentioned, like uh, Freud there, and I remember like reading something. I can't. Or I think it was an article or something. It could easily even be on the fucking Wikipedia page, but it's something about like the f- like the Freudian reading of this film. Like you know, the whole idea of like what happened to Mark coming from his dad. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that he's using like the tip, like the knife edge of the camera to kill people like he's using a, the phallic imagery to kill women yeah exactly and that yeah. whole thing like there's like and that's like that's a freudian reading of this film which is one that like you know you can easily do but it's not the one that i like i don't think either of us would really be interested in that it's more the the like the image and the 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 idea of filmmaking as like a like as a as a madness like scorsese uh check the twitter for this because i'm gonna post this like video of like scorsese talking about um michael powell and, and peeping tom but he described this film as like talking about like movie making as a madness which is such a great way of describing this film i think mm. and the danger of the gaze that's what yeah. that's something he said as well it was it, the, the essay was called uh visual pleasure and narrative cinema i like yeah like you say it's like it's like a really freudian reading of it which is really like easy to uh applied to this movie but i don't really understand a lot of what that sort of stuff talks about yeah i don't understand freud i say i say if you the whole thing about like like uh uh, parental issues and like uh stuff like that that obviously that that definitely applies to this movie because the trauma is obviously rooted in what mark experienced with his father and then even in psycho it's rooted in his experience with his mother and they both also stay um they both remain at the side of trauma in their houses in their childhood homes and like that's it's like this sort of uh, echo chamber where they just get increasingly more unhinged and uh, removed from reality. Mm-hmm. But- I think though that Mark's one is way more interesting because not only is he is he living in the area, he's rewatching his trauma over and over and over again mm. on the on the on the cameras, and I think that's like a way more interesting version of like mm. of like re-experiencing trauma, especially. Because right now. it's way more relevant now, yeah. Because you, you technically could just keep reliving your trauma. Like if something happened to you, and it was caught on film or whatever, which is you know, if say you're in a fight, mm. you can watch yourself getting the shit kicked out of you over and over again if someone captured it like yeah and that can be a traumatic thing and you can go through the comments online of people fucking laughing at you for whatever happened or whatever like you can do that if that happens to you you can do it and like same again like mark experienced child abuse and it just so happened to be captured on film and he watches it over and over again yeah there's also a thing about uh one of the quotes is i've never in his childhood i never knew one moment's privacy and uh there's this whole idea that his, his dad used to wake him up in the middle of the night and like project like this beaming light onto his face and throw a lizard on him. Yeah, just just to frighten him. And like uh, apparently he was uh, studying the nervous system's reaction to fear in children. Mm. As like this uh, is more even more relevant now in terms of like the panopticon, like the way people are always watched, especially in terms of uh, imagery and social media. Like you're always being watched, and you're always you're always having to. Cult- you're always on film. You're always being yeah. You're always basically being filmed, and you're always having to cultivate how you project your own image of yourself. But Mar- like Mark had that sort of robbed of him, in a way. I, I suppose like most people do these days. Uh, like he was filmed before he had any opportunity to project his own sense of self. So he had that mm. projected on him by his father, who's now gone, and he's just sort of like caught in this traumatic loop of reliving horror every single day yeah and it's uh you really feel from him as well it's, you feel very very bad for him like, yep even yep. though he kills uh, all these like you can, helpless women like that like you know you can understand him being fucking mental because of what happened to him which makes him a sympathetic character I don't know about the whole you know murdering women women thing I don't know that's if i agree with that bro it. but that's also but it's also besides that like you understand especially like the whole like carrying the camera stuff like you understand that mm. it's also like a 
in terms of the film, how he the fact that he preys on women is, is like I don't know if it was intentional, maybe it wasn't, but the fact that um he goes after women and they're all very beautiful women obviously and he's filming their last moments and he wants to see their like the horror on their face. Uh it ties into the whole thing of like if he preyed on men it'd be di- it'd be a bit different. It ties into the whole thing with like the gays and women yeah. as like sort of a objectified bearer of meaning and men as the makers of meaning. Uh, yeah. So like he's fallen into that trap and he can't get out of it. So he just has to relive it again, and again, and again. And like people get pulled into his sort of his traumatic space and they they can't do anything about it. But like it's not like uh, it's like replaying independently of Mark himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I that uh, that thing that you said like were like women being like objectified and like men being like the owners of like capturing or whatever that like that's so true within the film itself because the whole thing is like mark fucking goes off and he like takes photos he takes porn photos and the whole thing is like like you know the object the uh objectification of women especially like the scene at the start of the film where your man's going in and he's trying to buy the porn magazines but he has to be like real careful about what he's saying and it's like oh yeah i heard that you like you you got this stuff is basically what he's saying yeah. and he buys instead of buying like one or two he buys the whole lot of like porn pictures and he has to hide it and the like hiding of desire that hiding of like of like your objectify of your uh, objectification of women, and Mark is also doing that as well. You know, Mark takes the photos, but he also kills women <laughs> yeah. in a really brutal way, and he has to, he's hiding that as well. Um, it is like that's such a thing. That's a thing within the film, which is like such an so interesting to me because I think that like the whole idea that the film is talking about filmmaking, the film is talking about the image that the like the um the 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 effect that the image has all the while the objectification of women is tied into that as well that media itself objectifies women because men are the ones behind the film mm, yeah it's like a uh it's like a, a doubling effect you know mm. it's like a mirror it's just repeating yeah. repeating what already exists uh materially uh you know back and forth it's just a mirror effect definitely sort of reflects in the way that the film was received as well like it's famous for being uh very very poorly received it. yeah it was not like it was not like it was so watching it now i'm just like how did anyone think this is a bad movie well no i don't think they thought it was a bad movie they just thought it was scandalous like yeah i suppose yeah but like, he completely like, tainted his it yeah. fucking destroyed his career like michael powell he was a big guy big man Maybe not these days, because I don't know any film that he directed, but apparently he but was... Because, but it's because of this film. Well, he was, like... I don't know anyone, really, that directed movies in the 50s, except for, like, the major guys, but, um, like, he was a big fella in the British industry, the British British film industry, and he released this movie, and it was pulled from, from theaters, like, within within a month, and he wasn't... He wasn't... He didn't really make a movie again. Like, he had to move to France or Spain, I think, mm, to like make films. Yeah, it destroyed his career. Even though it's easily one of the best horror movies ever made. Yep. In my opinion, one of like the best movies ever, to be honest. And same uh, as well. Yeah, like genuinely, it's so well made. Out, every out every, of what I've seen, it's amazing. Yeah, every shot, every like line is like is perfect, and the, the the overall analysis is just like the way it approaches those subjects at such like a an early period in the development of uh, of our understanding of image. On film mm. and the impact it has on society, it's it's just out it's just out there. Like I think as well. Like I love this film <laughs> so much because like when we get to Nightcrawler, I'm going to talk about like the idea, like the film, kind of like blatantly talking about its message. Mm. But this film is like at some points it is kind of obvious that they're talking about like you know a great a bigger idea, but it's self-contained within the experience of Mark and grounding it within Mark's story. That it just works. It never feels like the film is like winking and nudging at at the fucking audience, being like, "Oh, you, <laughs> we're talking about you here." It's not like that mm. at all. Which makes it even more interesting the fact that people, like people, sort of expose themselves by reading, reading into it that they were Mark, which is really obvious yeah. reading, but it's the, the, it's not really deliberately hinted at in the movie. 
But the film doesn't fucking like literally stare at you and like yeah. have like a blatantly open line like at the end of fucking Cannibal Holocaust. Like it's not like oh I wonder who the real savages were after all. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have a moment like that. I wonder who the which real is killer amazing was. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Because this is 1960s. Exactly. <laughs> <is> yeah. 19- <laughs> the ending is really cool as well because we didn't talk about the ending last time. Um, ending is great. The way he uh, the way he kills them as well is like technique. He uses the tripod to stab them, but like. When you're seeing them being killed, like they have these this horrified reaction on this on their face, which is like, yeah, they're being killed, but it's a bit over the top, and uh, yeah. like that's the feeling you get. But that at the end, it's revealed that attached to the tripod leg, he has a a mirror, uh, so they can watch their own. Death. Yeah, so they watch themselves being killed, and that's why they're so horrified. It's like it's the whole thing again, like mm, watching. <laughs> yeah, they're gazing at their own demise, and uh, I don't know. It's like a, it's it just ties into the whole thing with like. Mm you know, watching yourself, your sense of self, um, like those positive feedback loops of the image recycling back into, from representation into the real. It's really weird. It is weird. I, like, I took a few a few uh, notes on this. The, uh, the opening of the film is an eye opening and the ending of the film is a film reel finishing out, which is like this weird, like parallel, like bookmarking of the two ends of the film. Mm. Um, you know the eye opening. You know, you blink and you're starting to watch the film, and then you're when once you're finished, you know the film reel ends. But even like within the narrative itself, you know the the camera being the uh, or no, is the television or the camera that's the mind's eye? Which one is that? Television is the mind's eye, is the retina of the mind's eye. Well, I think that applies to the camera it's, mm. itself as well. Sure, didn't but, you know, have TV back then. That the uh, sure yeah <laughs> that uh, but that thing like where um. Uh, Mark wants to uh, he wants to capture a uh, true authentic fear which can never be acted like true mm. authentic fear can never ever be acted but Mark is capturing it because he is um, he's about to kill them before he fucking, yeah. he's recording them before he kills them yeah. they're literally staring into their own demise and they're horrified by it mm. and uh, I think it's it's really, really interesting that, like, you know, he's trying... And I think that's what Scorsese is talking about, that, you know, that that madness of wanting to make films, you know, that, like, wanting to get authentic, real emotion out of your actors and everything. And, like, you know, trying to get that, that reaction out of the audience itself mm. is, like, you know, that can never, ever be properly achieved because you can't... Yeah, unless you... You can't do that. Unless you, like, elicit, like, an actual authentic response by actually, like, hurting someone or, like you know well, interacting with to, them yeah. like that like that's how mark does it basically you'd have it? to like uh, you'd have to like actually hurt the audience mm. or no you would have to actually hurt the fucking the um the actors yeah the actors and then actually like threaten to hurt the audience <laughs> as well to ex- to actually get like an authentic fear out of them mm. um which, Mar- which this- mark can never get as well because he's like trapped within like he experiences everything through his camera mm. and the camera like the image defines like, What's real? Yeah, from? like there's a first person perspective shot in this one, which is similar to uh, Halloween and Friday the Thirteenth, and like loads of slashes after after it. But this one is more like, um, like that's how he authentically sees himself, and this is how we sort of auth- authentically see these days, uh, mediated through a camera or a screen, yep. and this is how he sees himself, and like th- we're in his position, which is also our position, which is uh, killing uh, these helpless women or whatever. Yeah, because we like in those shots, you know, we take the the perspective of Mark. Yeah, and where we are, Mark, in those situations, and it is like this, like such a voyeuristic experience. And I imagine, like you know, for people back in nineteen sixties, that wasn't the norm. And I like it probably was disgusting to feel that for the first time, because it's such an alien feeling. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um... It is. It's a, it's a strange one, though. The ending is very sad as well, I thought. Because, as you say, it's like the film reel dying out. It's one of his home movies. Mm-hmm. So it's like... Which I think I think that ties into, though, as well. The You know the way before that you talked about, like, um, he views his life as a film. And he says, yeah. like, oh, that segment of my life or that sequence or something, he says. That ties into, literally, like, the end of his life is the end of the film. Like, Mark's life is a film, both outside and inside the film. Yeah, he's even, he's like, he planned his, he's almost planned it himself in a three-act structure. 
like you know the way it's at the end where he, that he, he bit plans is so his own good death. yeah it's <laughs> that, very very good that bit where like he's like he's sitting with the cameraman and like he's recording them and like the cameraman is just like oh you're gonna get caught if you do that and he's just like, well, I hope they do catch me because they seem very effective. But like, he's not talking about, he's not talking about like that moment there. He's talking about the fact that he's the one that they're looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or at the at the end when he he plans, he's planned already that he's gonna record his own death mm. by uh, stabbing himself with the tripod and, and watching and his, watching own, his death. own death. Yeah, it's like it's like that. That is metal. That is intense. How um. How important, or like, what's your idea of like the the mother character in the film being blind? How significant do you think that is? The fact that she's blind, but she's the only one that can see Mark for what he actually is. Yeah, blindness. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty interesting because like he's always he sees things in like in terms of images and stuff. Like mm. he, he counts different. He sees life in terms of scenes and sequences. He even talks about. Uh, his childhood in terms of like sequences rather than yeah. like uh, a natural narrative that you think in your head whereas like a blind woman can't see anything obviously so she doesn't imagine that as like a mo- she's never seen a movie she doesn't imagine it as a movie she, she like she senses things through like touch and sound which are like like you could sort of we could go back a while into this and like you know the way McLuhan went on about how we were in like an optical age like mm-hmm. once you started writing yeah. d- writing things down and reading um the the eye became the the primary sensory organ of the human, whereas before that was more of an oral thing or a an aural sort of yeah. experience. She's like from that that sort of tradition where she just experiences things in terms of how she she's hit- not manipulated by what she sees. Yeah, exactly. She's not she's not subject to the cult of the image the same way that Mark is. Was Mark's like controlled by this? He's trapped within this like hyper real hellscape, and he like he can't get away out. Whereas like here's this like innocent sort of like traditional idiot prototype you can't actually see at all so she's completely immune from all the uh looping effects that he's been subject to since he was a kid but she's the only one that can actually see that yeah. he's because she's literally like stay away from my daughter like she, she knows, knows yeah, yeah. that there's something wrong and she's like she's in the when he's like he's like watching um him he's like watching a video or like the film of him killing like one of the women in the film and she can't see it, but she knows that something horrible is going on within uh, with whatever he's watching. And she goes up and she's touching the wall where like it's playing out on. And she knows that he he's watching something really fucked up. Yeah, she's got the vibes. She's vibey. But it is such an interesting thing that the one bl- the, the blind character, I mean, it's obvious now. Like, oh yeah, the blind person can really <laughs> see the truth or whatever. But again, this is 1960. Like, it's, yeah. you know, I don't think it was really done in film beforehand. <laughs> yeah, it's mad. But uh, Especially in this context of the image and film itself being the thing that does it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the blind woman is key. Also, the, you know the part where in the movie where uh, he's talking with the psychologist, and the psychologist knows his dad, yes. and he's, he's yeah, like yeah, explaining yeah. how his dad was into like studying scoptophilia, which is like an actual yeah peeping tom, sub- yeah basically, basically peeping toms, yeah. But like it's also like basically a description of the the modern condition, like as a rule, like the sort of significance of looking at things and uh, the primacy of visual communication. It was definitely something that Freud talked about, but I, I don't know anything about him. But uh, it was like one of the main three things that he said to find uh, people in their infancy. So that that says a lot about us, you know. Especially in nineteen sixty, is like this film is way ahead of its time. I think as well the um, the, like the significance of uh, Helen, who's like you know the kind of like vague love interest for Mark, kind of whatever she is. Mm. But like when she find when she's watching the videos of Mark killing the women. She's horrified, but she can't take her eyes off it. She keeps watching. Even when she's, like, she's walking away from, like, the fucking film reel. And she's, like, going towards the door. But she keeps her eyes on the film. Mm. Until she ultimately bumps into Mark. But Mark doesn't want to kill her. Mark says, like, don't, don't let me look at you. Don't look at me. Don't show me that you're scared. Because he's obsessed with capturing fear. And yeah, he's going to yeah. kill her if he sees that she's scared. But... You know, that thing where, like, not being able to take your eyes off something that you really should not be looking at. But we all do it. Like, we all have that morbid curiosity. Or, like, a lot of us do, anyway. Mm. I certainly do. Oh, yeah. Of that morbid curiosity of, like, 
watching things that you you know, shouldn't be looking at. Yeah, it's like an instinctual thing. And this film taps into that. Like that's yeah. the dark uncomfortableness of humans mm. is that we we're all we're, we're all a little bit like Mark. Perverts. But um It didn't even have to be vi- it doesn't have to be sexual thing. It can be fucking violence as well. Mm. We're perverts for for voyeurism for watching horrible things happen. Mm. And ultimately like the film itself is kind of talking like <laughs> especially because you know this is one of the first slashers and considering that slashers you know literally films about watching people die is such a huge fucking genre yeah exactly, the film yeah. itself is a critique of that that the like the film genre that it itself started it's a critique of because it's like why do you want to watch people dying <laughs> why do you want to watch someone get torn inside out yeah it's a weird thing it comes up quite a bit as well like it sees the the image as like a killing thing like, if you're captured on... Like, you know those guys, those African... There's, like, an African tribe where they think... It's, like, all, like, factoid or whatever. Like, the African tribe that thinks... Uh, if you take their picture, that you've robbed their soul. Yeah, Scorsese talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Um, but, like, it's that sort of thing shows up again in the movie. Like, where she takes the camera from him. And she's, like, pretending to film herself, almost. And he's like, no, no, no. Don't do that. Never, ever do that. Because he, he, he understands the image as... Uh, or capturing someone's image as like a, a murder. Yeah, taking their like, soul, taking something away yeah, from them. Yeah, literally a murder, but also like it's objectifying the person, reducing them to a representation, like a completely desacralized object rather than a, a human, which is the only way that he can kill people, and which is why he's so good mm. at killing people, because he can't actually authentically interact with any person. Yeah, especially because he's killing them. He, like, he doesn't ever watch them. When he's killing someone, he doesn't look at them like face to face. He's looking at them through the through the camera, yeah, yeah, which gives that like that distance for him to allow him to kill them nearly. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like it's like oh, I can I can kill them because if they they've literally become an object. But that thing uh, about like you know turning people into objects, I think uh, Nightcrawler in a really interesting way ties into that because I feel like Nightcrawler is about commodifying people's trauma and people's experiences if you know what i mean um i think a key thing with nightcrawler is is uh, how it starts because he's do you want to give like a quick like plot summary of uh, nightcrawler because uh yeah um our nightcrawler is about lou bloom who is like a deadbeat a complete deadbeat uh no job no money he like lives in like a small studio apartment a con artist we can say yeah yeah he lives in a small studio apartment by himself um only he watches TV all day. Uh, he has one plant. That's all we know about him. Um, and he's like trying to. He like steals things to make money at first. Uh, but then he turns into uh, a night. He turns into a nightcrawler basically, which isn't a superhero. Which is an actual thing. Which is an actual which thing. thing where people go around <laughs> with cameras and uh, take video of accidents and disasters and shootings, whatever scandalous crime. situations, and they sell it to news news stations. And he makes money off that. It's basically his... It's the story of his sort of descent. Or more like his ascent into, like, fame. Yeah, is it descent or is yeah, it a rise? He's already, That's he's already fucked, basically. And he's yeah. fucked up and he's like a psychopath. But he becomes... he, he Basically, at the end of the movie, he wins. Uh, which is a pretty notable part of the, about this movie. Mm-hmm. But it, it starts... The only way to succeed is to... The- fuck people over basically yeah yeah if you want a if you want a good job if you want a good life you should watch this movie and use it as a guide for how to how to succeed in business because and how you should be an absolute fucking psychopath and just like you know step on people and kill them arguably <laughs> exactly yeah and exploit them lou, lou if anything he's a great businessman he's a really good businessman and that's sort of he is the best capitalist worker i've ever seen in the film well he's like he's like the perfect sort of subject of of the modern day, he's like he's not even a worker. He's like employer and labor at the same time. He's an, like a true entrepreneur. He rejects perfectly rational offers to go into business with other people to make more money, just to like sort of satisfy his own individual need to uh, prove himself, like to justify his own existence by accomplishing these things on his own himself. Yeah, rather yeah. than doing it as part of the team. But um, yeah, it's a hundred percent. It starts with. Um, him as like a scrap collector, like he he robs uh, copper and wire fence and uh, manhole covers, and he brings it into this like like a scrap dealer I think, 
I think it's like a scrapyard or like a junkyard, and he sells it to this guy. But like the way he sells it, he walks into this this office basically. Um, he's selling it by the pound, like wire by for a certain certain amount, uh, iron by a certain amount, copper by a certain amount, or whatever. But he sells these things, these objects, in the same way that he sells video of people dying an hour later. Yeah. He sells them in the exact same way with like a, this mad smile on his face and his hair greased back. And he's using all these yeah. these like canned phrases. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm a winner. He's I'm like, like a f- I'm, I'm a hard worker. He's like an advertisement. Yeah, he, he's like a video game character. Like everything he does, his, even his movements, the way he talks, everything's like a canned phrase. Everything's recalled from memory from what you see on TV or like in a self-help book or like online. I think Gyllenhaal is amazing in this film. Like he is incredible in this film because of that reason. Yeah, he's pretty good. He captures that like manic, psychotic salesman that like Lou Bloom is. Mm. And it's um and it's integral to the character. Yeah, he's basically he's like less of a human than like a database. Like mm. he just he just knows things. Like another way like you'd remember things through like a narrative or a story. Like you remember things in blocks or like as part of your like your life story. He remembers things as like these like discrete sort of units of information that he just recalls yeah. on command with no sort of no need for context or uh, any sort of further narrative. He just vomits them out in order to get what he wants. Yeah, it's the uh, it is like the self help books and the courses and everything like that he's ever done. Or like all those like you know those ads you see and it's like you could sell Ethereum on fucking on the stock market too like he's like he is literally like he's that guy all those courses turn into one person and that's all it is that's he's no longer a person he's just an amalgamation of ads yeah he's just a puppet and he like and he uses them to like completely fuck over people and get what he wants and not only like that he like he completely demeans people because of it he's literally like because like Rick is just like oh what am I gonna get my uh you know my bonus or whatever, you know, when are you going to start paying me? And he just, like, spouts out, like, fucking yeah. corporate, corporate, corporate bollocks towards him. If, and if you said that in office, people would be like, yeah, that's such a great point. It's like, you yeah. make, that makes so much sense, you know? It's like, if you watch this film and take down what he says and use it in, in an interview, you'd probably get the job. Like, a lot of what he's... A hundred percent, A lot of it is completely, like, reasonable uh, in job speak, he lit- you know? He he's literally like I'm a fast learner, you know. I like to take my own initiative, but I like to stay within the corporate like infrastructure and stuff like that. Like that's exactly what Jobs wants you to say. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's like, you know, the way he says, uh, "If you want to win the lottery, you have to make the money to buy a ticket." He has like these canned phrases that he says like multiple times. The only reason that we know that or that we see it as weird is because he repeats them and we see him repeating them. Whereas whoever whoever he's talking to just sees it as like, oh, this guy's a fast learner. He's he's self driven. Yeah. He's motivated. He's a, he's a yeah. Good it's worker. only weird because we see him saying it multiple yeah, times. Yeah, he's yeah, fucking 100%. crazy. Like, you know, but he, he's yeah. a he's a great businessman and a great entrepreneur. And I think like the thing, I think the important thing, like the way that it ties into uh, Peeping Tom as well, is that it's 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 film. It's the video, it's the image, it's the same thing that Mark is touching on in Peeping Tom, you know, the not being able to look away from trauma, not being able to look away from horrible images, mm. the spectacle itself. Lou Bloom uses that yeah, yeah. to rise within this system. Mm. I even remember the, uh, remember the point when he, I think it's the first shooting he goes to, where he breaks into the house. Or he's late to the scene. And yeah. He, he needs, and he's moving shit yeah, around. Yeah, he needs a shot. So he goes to the fridge and there's like, there's pictures of a family on the fridge and they have like their dog and like a little calendar and stuff. And like like a, a normal person or like the viewer watching the movie, they're like, oh, this is a family like this. They have like a backstory and stuff like, oh, you, you, you feel empathy for them. But all he sees through his camera is an opportunity to make money by selling these images to the, I know that the he... film state or to the TV station. Yeah, and he he moves them around as well to make it more tragic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he it's it's just it's, like, it's just like a it's like a modular thing. It's just like a way for him. It's like a challenge. It's like a puzzle for him to just rearrange to maximize yeah, value how, rather than to understand uh, organically. How yeah? How do I maximize the emotions out of this image as opposed to, my God, it's really fucked up that this happened to a family. Yeah, he's just had to break into a gaff as well. It's like some that, of the stuff that happens and, in this movie is just ridiculous. 
and it, it, it is like because like that progresses to like such an extreme level mm. to like later on in the film where like you know he's like actively like withholding information to police and then setting the police up so that it's guaranteed that like you know the villains like the the two murderers that he's like kind of following that they're gonna shoot the police and he's gonna capture that on film like that level is ridiculous but you know it's um you know it's really intense when it happens it's really well done and i think it's a a, a really important aspect of the film that we're we see that happening through the camera like we're watching that through the camera screens Mm. that they're recording on which i think is pretty important yeah everything's sort of through the camera even there's a there's a point when he comes across like uh, a car crash and he moves the dead body to get a better angle on it mm-hmm. and he's like he's standing back and he has this like this like mad look on his face but it's like like all his, his expression and like his emotions are com- like at all times completely divorced from the actual authentic situation around him like his actual environment like you basically see dollar signs in his eyes at all times like he can only see yeah. he can only see how he's going to maximize value in the future from any given situation that he's in every relationship is like oh how am i gonna make money out of it mm. like you know his relationship with the woman in the in the tv studio it's i am mean, pretty sure later on like when he's sitting at the table with her he's literally just talking about like how relationships are just about how you like how you can like maximize your worth or like your gain mm. out of like someone else and he's like oh what is it they say friendship is something that you give yourself but he's he's distorted that's like friendship is a way that i can get something out of that person so that i have gained something and that's what i'm giving myself yeah he's he's this really like clinical but also like really accurate sort of uh analysis almost of relationships in uh the modern era i suppose like really transactional it's like more like coalitions rather than uh authentic relationships like she needs him to make money for uh or to keep her job for uh to keep up ratings and he needs her to satisfy himself basically and to to uh, gain more connections in the industry, I think mm. that scene is so creepy at the uh, at the the diner. It's so oh weird. my god, it's so fucked That's up. Really and well especially because like he wants not only does he want to like professionally exploit her, but he wants to fuck her yeah, as well. Yeah, he wants to have sex. And, she, and she, he's just like, "Well, you need me more than I need you." Yeah, even the way he he like starts off the date, he's like, uh, "I like the the dark makeup under your eyes." I like the way you talk. I like the way you smell. It's like he's, he's analyzing. Yeah, her. he's just listing off. It's like he's he's written the script before he he's arrived and listing off different things that he's counted that would make her feel good, rather than like having an actual conversation with her. He's such a creepy fuck. Yeah, yeah. He's like he's, he's so creepy. He's like the logical conclusion of what Mark from Peeping Tom would be like sixty years on, I suppose. Yeah, just like oh, yeah, completely that's just, that's divorced from reality. Comparison. Yeah, at least like Mark at that at that stage, Mark had a bit of humanity to him. You know, he didn't want to kill uh, Helen, and he didn't want to like capture her on the on the footage. Meanwhile, Mark is like, if the woman in this, I don't know what her name is, but you know, um, if she like, you know, if she was in a car crash, no fucking bother. That's just another photo opportunity. There's no bother to that. I'll capture that because that's a way for me to get the image and to make more money. Yeah, yeah, he's like no, he's no uh, emotions, no authentic emotions anyway. Even the way he no he, empathy whatsoever. He kills Rick basically. I felt so bad for Rick. Just because. Yeah, he, <laughs> like he killed him because he's like he basically threatened. He made a power move against Lou by threatening to turn him into the cops, and uh, so Lou has him taken out basically, and yeah. um, he dies. And he films his partner's death and sells it to the TV station for what, like what fifteen grand or something. I felt I felt so bad for Rick, but when you think about it. Rick is. Uh, but he sold him. He sold himself out. As yeah, well. Rick sort of sells himself here as well, because Rick is like Lou's partner. He's much more like understandable for selling himself out, though, as opposed to like Lou, because you know Lou had a gaff and all, but Rick is like broke and homeless. Yeah, I sort of agree, but like also like Lou is a complete loser. He is like you know the point where he's he's offering Rick the job and he's like, uh, I can offer you an internship. Mm. Like he's just sort of assuming this role as employer like a chameleon like he's he's like the man has no money he's no job he like lives alone in like this like shitty apartment his bed even the fact he that, lives in a one bedroom that, like, apartment or one room apartment sorry the way that he gets rick as well is just by lying to him saying that the corporation is much bigger than that yeah. even though it's just one dude that started like two weeks ago yeah yeah he, he, like he lies and he adopts his persona as an employer but like lou is a loser like he has nothing 
and he's just he's just he's just better at lying or like better at getting his way than Rick is basically. I think that's yeah. that's one of the things that was uh, that sort of came up that's, on my second watch because I watched it. That's back it, when it came that's out. key. I think mm. especially like when Rick is negotiating and he's like seventy five dollars um, a night. And Lou's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then Rick's like, I could have got way more than that, couldn't I? He's like, oh, yeah, definitely. He's like, absolutely. <laughs> and he just keeps trying. Absolutely. <laughs> and this drives. And then Rick is like, can I open up, open up negotiations again? He's like, nope. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> He's just... But like, it's like, you're, you, like, he has no idea like how much control he actually has or how much power that he has. Mm. Meanwhile, Lou knows exactly at all times how yeah. much power he Lou has. Lou is just a great businessman, which is, I think, the only difference. Because you, f- you do feel bad for Rick, like, all through the film. And there's also, like, a competing Nightcrawler, uh, played by Bill Paxton. And he's a... Uh, who gets fucked. Yeah, he gets fucked up by Lou, by who, like, he, like cuts his brakes, I think. And um, so he gets fucked up. And you feel bad for him, but... They're both... Rick and Bill Paxton's character are basically the same as Lou. They're just worse at their jobs basically or like maybe yeah, maybe it's not as effective yeah maybe bill paxton is just like more morally upright i suppose but like they're still terrible people like rick sells himself out like he he, he uh he agrees to turn a blind eye to uh this horrendous crime yeah, that that lewis so committed. basically he, he he agrees to turn a blind eye to murder essentially in return for uh what twenty five thousand dollars i think on the night um when he gets killed, yeah, I don't think I th- he says 50 50. 50 50, yeah, which is like a 50,000 reward, which he has no idea what 50 50 is. Yeah, it was a few thousand anyway, but uh, yeah, he, he basically sells himself out and then lose, like, you know, he basically just takes him out because he can because he's better at, Especially, at the business. Like, I think as well, like, Rick is given a lot of opportunities to walk away, like, there's that moment where he's like, I am not going out there and mm, uh, true. and recording whatever happens. Meanwhile, Lou is like, You will, or else I'm gonna. Basically, I'm gonna kick the shit out of you. Well, he could just walk away. Yeah, and turn him in. And Rick and Lou is not gonna risk an opportunity of not recording whatever happened. He's not gonna risk that. Yeah, true. Yeah, he could have walked away definitely. Um, I think though that like the the idea of Lou, um, not only you know like being involved with the camera and the camera itself being the way that he like rises to the ranks, I think it's like really integral to the film because the film also talks about like you know um the integrity and like you know uh journalistic uh honor or integrity you know telling the truth and stuff like that that you know lou not only does he manipulate reality he creates a reality because the camera has allowed him to do that yeah 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 he manipulate manipulates at quite a few moments especially when um like the way he turns around the cops and stuff like that. Mm. Like he sees, he has the footage. He knows who killed those people in the house, um, and he has he has their license number or license plate number. But he like he withholds he withholds the information just so he can get a better shot out of it when he calls it in himself and uh, provokes a shootout with the police. It's like it's genius, but like it's basically psychopathic. It's, yeah, it's basically just he's just following the rules, basically like how how he's been incentivized to uh, to film these things and to create these situations himself. Like you were saying you watched uh, like an actual documentary about real nightcrawlers where these sort of things... No, I've heard about it. I haven't watched it though. Oh, okay. but I, I want to... It's on Netflix. I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called. Um, but it is a thing. Like It is a thing. Mm. And in that documentary because I've heard that the the climax of episode one is that, you know, it's a, it's a documentary about actual nightcrawlers and one of them is sitting on a highway for whatever reason and he looks across and he can see that a car is stalled and instead of running to help or doing anything he just sits there with his camera because he knows that a car is going to crash into it and inevitably a car does and apparently like you know it was really brutal but as the nightcrawler he's the first one there to take the images of it he's got the cash and Lou and Lou takes that to such a like it is that thing where like you were talking about earlier where, like you know moving the body and you know I think it's great progression in the film of he walks he breaks into the family's house and he moves the photos around on the on the the fridge to make a more emotional shot and then he moves the body to get a better shot of the body Mm. with the car crash to the extent where he is now manipulating the people around him to force a shootout with the cops so that he can get that image Mm. 
Yeah. I think that's such a that's such an like it's such a great ending though when he's like he's bombing it in the car and like just chasing after the police and the police gets wiped out but he's still there and he's still following the the killer mm. and then the killer like takes out another policeman but he's still right there behind. <laughs> it's such a great ending, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's such a climax of like the chaos that he has created. Like this has gone way out of control. But Lou is still in control of the situation because he has that camera and because he can manipulate and create realities from that camera. Mm, yeah, yeah. And plus he's like, the way he treats things, he treats people as, uh, he sort of, props. yeah, he, yeah, he li- treats people as props. So he lives up to the fake reality that the image is. Like he, he accepts the fact that the image is just like a representation and he uses people as props and objectifies people and reduces them to the pixels on his camera rather than thinking mm-hmm. about them as actual human beings. And it pays off. 100%. It pays off in uh, in dividends for him because oh, he makes loads. Of, he makes a lot of money <laughs> very, very fast. And uh, he moves up in the world. And it's basically a story of his, like we were saying at the start, it's basically a success story. It's about how he, how he wins. He wins at the end, basically. Um, it's a decline into like moral depravity. Mm but a rise within the capitalist system that uh, like encourages this nearly. Yeah. But you know, you get those really cool shots. So, you know, it doesn't really it matter. It is. That's just a thing in the film that we're literally she's just like, I'm pretty sure there's a line. He says to the girl at the kitchen ta- or at the dinner t- or at the diner table that like, you know, he's just like, Oh, crime is down 80% yet. You know, crimes uh, take up 80% of the, of uh, the newsreel. Meanwhile, politics, weather, sports and something else they only take up like 10 percent or whatever like he's just listening off about like all the things about news and how like the news doesn't accurately portray reality and that it creates its own reality but like overemphasizing like you know the crime which is down massively mm, yeah, yeah like the way she talks about like they need a uh, middle class neighborhoods like pref- preferably white people and stuff like that um yeah it's weird how that, that like positive feedback loop just like as it's sort of like Lou uh, is the catalyst to uh, move to the next stage of uh, of feedback. Like it just keeps mm. getting more and more sensational. Like the the film itself is basically just like a it's like a it's like a graph just like going directly up. Yeah, you know, it just gets it just escalates constantly, like all the way through. It's such a it is great because especially like that first montage of him like trying to figure out like uh, how far close to the bodies or the car crash or whatever can I be until the police tell me to fuck off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's he's pushing boundaries. He's he's a, he's a great worker. He's a great entrepreneur. He's seeing how far he can go, and uh, it all works. It all works very well. He's a genius, basically. He is a genius. He's the genius of the nightcrawlers. Yeah. Um. I think it's great. I think this film is great. Mm. I think there's a few bits like I said earlier about like you know um, the whole like you know message kind of overtaking which you don't get with the uh, peeping tom but there's a bit in this film where um, Rick and Lou are sitting in the car and Rick looks at um, Bed Bath and Beyond and he like he like recites like he's like oh Bed Bath and Beyond and just lists off a few things and then he just like looks at Lou and he's just like huh and they just stopped at a random like red light or whatever and he's just like he just turns to me like you gotta make uh, peace with what you don't have isn't that right Lou and Lou just like takes off because he's heard that like you know there's like a new crash or whatever and it's just like that at moments like that the film does have moments like that where the message of the film overbears the characters and the characters like especially Rick like they don't say things that they like nor like they wouldn't have that they, that they would have beforehand like that was so out of character but the reason why he said it was to hone in the message of the film mm. which i think is where like the film kind of falters but i don't i think peeping tom and on the other hand maintains that constantly in such a, a genius fucking way yeah almost because it like it predates any sort of uh rigorous analysis of uh of how those things work you mm. know um I also I, I saw the uh, back when this first came out I actually I saw the script because the script was like really big at the time uh, the script is great I think yeah yeah um, but like the way it's written except for those moments but you know whatever. the way it's written is like uh, like the script itself is like it's almost like impressionistic you know the way some scripts would be written like a play and some yeah. would be written like almost like a half novel half play 
like they have like descriptions mm-hmm. and stuff like that like nightcrawler is just like a almost like a painting like it's just a series of images and then dialogue um that's so interesting. you know it's almost like uh like he's just thinking about the camera like the images itself like this is just this yeah. is a film film it's not really uh like he did direct it and write it so he didn't need to go into much detail but like the way it's written is just like one shot one shot one shot and then he says something but like every shot means something and you can see that in the film itself mm. Especially like the opening of the film, like there's a bit where like he's walking down, I don't know, so he's driving down like a a road or whatever, and he glances and he looks at like really expensive cars, and then it cuts back to his face looking at the expensive cars, and then it cuts to him looking at an ATM, and then it cuts back to him. So it's like, like it's literally like you wouldn't have like it's literally like the idea like images and like putting like two images together so that you can like figure out mm. the the meaning behind the two Im- images is like key to this film from the very get-go of the film yeah 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 it's really good it is good it is I've good always enjoyed very it. very good film i enjoyed it a lot more than i thought i would have when i watched it the second time because i remember watching this film like when i was 50 and i've been like yeah that film's pretty good but it was 2014 and there's a lot of films mm. that came big, out it's... again chronos <laughs> chronos <It was laughs> big year big year <laughs> As you discovered that, like today, like going through all the films that came out in twenty fourteen, but like it, it, like there were so many films that year that I think like this kind of got like washed away in the wave of when I was watching all these movies. But then coming back to me, you know, like fucking six years later, I'm like, this film is fucking class. Mm. It is really, really good, and I do, I do really enjoy it. Yeah, I really like it. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Are you ready, kids? Moving on to the listener questions. If you have a question, you can hit us up on uh, Twitter or Instagram at paro underscore pod. Or you can hit us up on uh, Gmail at theparopod at gmail.com. Mark, I think I deserve a pat on the back for that one. Because I think after 13 episodes, (laughs) that's the first one that I've gotten right. That's great. (laughs) That's great stuff. Uh, Yeah, all very true. Hit us up. Hit us up. Give us feedback. Give us uh, hot takes, opinions, uh, critiques. All right. So the first question comes in from uh, Connor Scully. Big man. Another fantastic, another, fantastic question. Another from great Connor. question, Connor. Thank you, Connor. Well, it's 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 not really a. Uh, it's a more question, like a request, more as like you know, a prompt. Mm. Connor came up with a good idea, and he asked us to uh, please react to uh, Wild Mountain Time. The trailer. Mark, have you seen this trailer? Yeah, I saw it there today. Um, I think you're in trouble if uh, Christopher Walken is the best Irish accent in the movie. Oh my god, I don't know how that works. How the fuck does Christopher Walken have the best Irish accent? And he's not even doing really an Irish accent. He's kind of just talking his own way. <laughs> he's like, I won't I won't give you the, the farm. He's like, he's just, he's just like, yeah, he's just doing his own He's just talking thing. normally. Well, and like a, a weird Irish, yeah, Irish twang. <laughs> It's not good. Um, we should do this part in an Irish accent. A fake Irish oh, accent. Oh, this film is bleeding <laughs> awful, isn't it? That's not even uh, proper either. Ah, uh, Jesus. Ah, uh, Jesus. Would you stop, Mark? It looks... <laughs> it looks... Uh, that's, e- that's not even the Irish accent they're doing in this. It's like... Oh. They're more like... Oh, the wild mountain time. Oh, Mark. Let me tell you now. I'll tell you now, Mark. The film itself. Uh, <laughs> Is the farm there, Johnny? It's uh, but it is those accents. Like it's so shit. <laughs> it's so shit. <laughs> it's just weird, especially because your man, your man Jamie Dornan is Irish. What I don't know is why he's putting on an Irish accent when he is Irish. Yeah, why? Just talk, talk normally, because Americans, if anyone is gonna know that an Irish accent is inauthentic, they'll know. You know, oh, this guy's from Ulster. He's not from fucking Connemara. Are they not going to notice the fact that Emily Blunt and fucking Christopher Walken and jo- and like the rest of them don't have Irish accents either? You know, it's stupid. Like, just let him talk as like a dairy man. Or I am. Um, I did a little bit of research into you know because this thing is uh, based on um, a a play, and you know yeah, I wanted yeah. to know a little bit more about the play and you know see what reactions that the play had. Now the original play called Outside Mullingar. Uh, written by John Patrick Stanley. John Patrick Stanley is directing this film as well. Um, and he wrote the original play. And he wrote the screenplay to this film. He wrote and directed uh, Doubt. 
before this. Do you remember Doubt? It's the one with the... Um, the nuns? Yes, and Philip Seymour Hoffman plays the priest in it. No, I've never seen I it. I haven't seen it either. Um, Amy Adams is also in it. I haven't seen it, but it looks like, you know, a, it's, a pl- it's a dramatic play uh, adapted to film. You know? You know what I mean by that? Mm. Like, you know, it's heavy. I went onto the IMDb page and it was nominated for Best uh, Leading Actor, Supporting Actor, Best Leading Actress, Supporting Actress, and screen and Adapted Screenplay. That's it. You know what I mean by one of those type of films? It's just yeah, about yeah. the acting. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, so this, like, so he directed that film, right? And the original mm. play, Outside Mullingar, was a nominated for a Tony for best uh, play and was praised by like New York Times and like, all the likes of them, right? The writer for the New York Times uh, actually wrote that this film had, um, or sorry, Mr. Shanley's lyrical writing is like, you know, up, up to par with normal, with like, you know, amazing writing, right? Mm. Skip across the pond where you come to Ireland and, you know, England where, you know, they're more aware of Irish accents. And uh, Fintan O'Toole, writing, writing from the, the Irish Times, said this film was mystifyingly, or sorry, the play was mystifyingly awful. <laughs> um, and believed that, like, uh, uh, like Stanley, you know, the writer, uh, mm. had misinterpreted Martin McDonough's, like, you know, critique and, like, his irony of, like, you know, the WB Yeats style of like writing um uh you know western ireland like, you know that because you know we mm. we study this in in college you know that like that abbey theater play like this is like this play is an american idea of what that is and it just fails mm. of that and irish people fucking hated this play because of it and it's being remade as a film and we get to see it <laughs> So wait, so an Irish person didn't write no, this? No, it's an American that wrote this. It's an American. Why would they write about that? He like, might have Irish ancestry. Maybe, yeah. But then you know, O'Toole, the guy from writing from the Irish Times, thinks that like yeah. your man uh, John Patrick Stanley had seen it, like he did he's not saying like, you know, this is what happened, but he's like it's almost like that. Uh O'Toole had seen a Martin McDonough play. A Martin McDonough is like he like like writes those like abbey plays you know out in the west and you know shit yeah. and we're fighting over land and stuff like that like he he writes about that but adds a huge layer of irony towards it where it's like oh irish people isn't this fucking isn't this bollocks that like you know we used to talk about this <laughs> but it's almost like o'toole watched and read those plays and thought that that was authentic so he recreated his yeah. like accents and dialogue based off that <laughs> yeah he like took it seriously because watching the trailer, it almost looks like it could be a good sort of piss take. But I don't think it is a piss take. It's not at all. You it's know? authentic. Yeah. It's a serious movie. That's not it's good. It's not good. That's not... It's, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I have another quote. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to say... Oh, sorry, uh, go on. Sorry, go on. I, I was just going to say, uh, I wouldn't say Americans should make these movies, but like... They should make these movies. I don't know. It's just it. it, it yeah, you go ahead. Uh, I have another quote from uh, Lynn uh, Gardner, who's like writer from the the Guardian. Uh, she said about the the original play because you know we can't comment on the actual film because the film isn't out yet. But the original play. The real problem here is that Stanley's vision of Ireland is filtered through soggy, rain-swept haze of theatrical cliches. Throwing in a few references to the expired Celtic Tiger doesn't make events any more contemporary or believable. He basically writes like, he'll throw in like the Celtic Tiger, but also be like, Oh, Jesus, we have to go down to the well and get some water. <laughs> like, it's that type of bullshit. <laughs> and like, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a man. I genuinely thought, that this film was set during famine times until they mm. cut to America. And I was like, oh my god, no, this is this is modern times. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's how the Irish are, huh? Oh. Still on the farm. St- st- still, uh, like, I, I, everyone knows, like, like you know, your grandparents or whatever, like, squabbling about the farm, like, who inherits the farm and stuff like that. But like that's like that's your grandparents or maybe your parents. That's a hundred years ago, you like, know. It's basically like, a hundred years that's, ago. 
that's at least decades ago. It's not like I don't know. It's it's funny. It's funny that they like they'd make this film though. It's just especially bizarre. now. It's really bizarre. <laughs> it's, yeah, why now? Why now? Like like what what asks for this f- to, to be, be made, fair? This know? the play was written in twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Like it's a new enough play. But like, <laughs> why does it need a film ad- adaptation? Because it almost won a Tony. Because it almost won a Tony. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason why yeah oh man. I, I, I just can't I can't get over the fact that Jamie Dornan has puts on an Irish I can't accent. get over the fact that Christopher Walken is in this film <laughs> I think that's going to be the best part because he's the best Irish accent out of, out of any, any of them like like Emily Blunt's Irish accent it looks like like a sketch from like SNL or something did you see the clips of like the original play no oh no. my god it's like your one is like she's she plays Grace in Will and Grace I can't remember her name but she's just like, she's like, they'd call me a heifer if they saw me, they would. And she's like, what? <laughs> Who the fuck talks like this? <laughs> Country gals. Shout out to Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's setting long for you, dude. <laughs> yeah, this play outside, outside, Mil- <laughs> outside Mullingar is setting long for it. <laughs> yeah. Is it set in Mullingar? Well, the original play is called Outside Mullingar. I don't think this one is. Oh, is it? Because this one shows, like, the seaside. Man, Mullingar is, like, is like the third most built-up area in, like, the whole island. Man, I know. It's just so bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I know that, like, dubs are pretty bad for just imagining, you know, anywhere outside of Dublin being, you know, cottages yeah. and shit. But at least we're not as bad as, you know, Americans who genuinely think that all of Ireland is just cottages. <laughs> that is that is a low standard. But one that I approve of. Yeah, you know... Everything dubs, outside Dublin is cottages. Dubs, we're not as bad as the Yanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we That's can say. That's all we can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. But yeah, it's, it is, it's a funny trailer, though. It gets people talking. It gets people talking. Maybe it's on purpose. Maybe. Imagine you know the way that like the Sonic trailer had to like do a redo and like re motion capture uh Sonic in the film. Yeah, and remove Gangsta's Paradise. Do you think that like the like this is the equivalent of that where like they just created this awful trailer to create outrage but they're yeah. just gonna like redub all the accents? <laughs> yeah, they 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 pull a bane and they all just do they get like authentic Irish people in to do the accents and stuff. Yeah, do you think that's gonna that's a possibility? <laughs> <laughs> I'm available if if uh, Jamie Dorn you know, hit me up. I'll, I can do it. No, don't don't hit me up. I'll just do a shit. I'll do the even worse like West of Ireland accent. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we'd be terrible at that movie. <laughs> we know people though. Shane McGinley can do it. He does drama. <laughs> yeah, I get Shane in. Yeah, exactly. We'd be laughing. We know loads of cultures. We know loads of cultures. We went to DCU. <laughs> yeah. We went to Paths. We know all the cultures. <laughs> yeah, more importantly, we went to Paths. We know all the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Do you want to take the uh, the next question from uh, from Carl? Oh, yeah. Second question comes in from Carl Sheridan. <laughs> Finally a- asked a question. Family um, to the podcast. <laughs> fam to the podcast. Friend to the podcast. Um, he asks... Are we living in Guy Debord's spectacle? Can we still have original thoughts these days? What do you think, Owen? Um, What's your thoughts? Well, <laughs> I just want to say to Carl that the, re- <laughs> the way that I read this first, his question was, are we living G? D D the board spectacle question mark. Are we living? Are G? we living G? I love it. D the board's spectacle, and I just read it first, and I was like. What? And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, G to board, not are we living G? <laughs> are we living G? Oh, that would also be a reasonable question. It would be. I was like, I was like, how do I, how do I ask that question on the podcast? Like, can I repeat, like, Carl Sheridan asks, are we living G? <laughs> well, are we? Um, Are we living in G to board says spectacle? I think so. I think, you know, uh, having recently read uh, the spe- or Society of the Spectacle uh, in full, I think so. Yeah, you know, uh, the idea of the spectacle taking control and, you know, distracting us from things that are going on. 
underneath the spectacle, I guess. You know, the image itself being the spectacle, I guess, or the capitalism being the spectacle. Mm. It kind of distracts us from what's really going on. I think so. Yeah. I think 100%. It's mutated. It's mutated, man. It's one of those things where, you know, people go on about like, oh, Karl Marx is all the right answers. And like, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. I'm not going to make a judgment here. This isn't a political podcast. This is a culture podcast. Well, this is whatever but, type of podcast that we want to make it, really. <laughs> all right. It's a political podcast. For this now. question, it's um, political. <laughs> but see, he never anticipated the spectacle or images itself or the way things would be colonized, no. the way that the board sort of uh, outlined, you know. Like he had a very good model, uh, from what I know. I haven't actually read uh, the spectacle, but I've read a few of his things, a few of his reports. I was gonna read a few things off it, but because of the lighting, yeah, um, I can't see the bits that I've highlighted. Oh, the irony! The irony. I uh, yeah, I can read off a few uh, a few bits, and uh, that I have like yeah, go on there, sorry, because you know more about like Karl Marx <laughs> and like his his more ideas. You know more about that. <laughs> well, like he didn't have. He never anticipated the image or like the cult of the image that we have today. Just the kind of thing that uh, that befell poor Mark and Peeping Tom, or that sort of possessed Lou Bloom in Nightcrawler. You know, I was literally just thinking that this actually very really ties into what we're talking about with the image and stuff like that. Very relevant, yeah, very relevant. Um, and Gideborg is a really cool sort of model for how to think about yes. that. Which is actually pretty hard to get your head around. Yeah, this small book is really... Like, this book is only, like, 120 pages. And it's really dense with ideas. And really, like, I, like... I think I'll, I'll be re I'll reread this again. Like, this is the second time that I've read this book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reread it again at a later stage. Because there is such, like, huge ideas. And you're gonna get, like, snippets of what he's talking mm, yeah, about. Yeah, it's, it's, like... Is it written in, like, aphorisms? Like, it's not really... Oh yeah, like they're all like really ideas. small um, ideas. Like there's like eighty five, like so like for instance, so the book is like numbered whatever. But each like this paragraphs and each paragraph is numbered. So like on the page I'm on right now, like I'm on page ten and there's point twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. And they're all like separate ideas that kind of tie into each other. Yeah, yeah. If you know what I mean. They're like tweets. And each like each chapter. Each yeah, they're like tweets. It's like a book of tweets in early. Really, really I genius ideas of tweets. Uh here's like here's a good one, I think. <clears throat> so like he's talking about like, you know, the spectacle, the image, media as a whole, and he's saying the representation of the working class has become an enemy of the working class. Which is, you know, that's just one line. And it's like there's like a universe of ideas within that one line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we could talk about that for hours, you know. And that's just, that's one line. That's the end of one of his points. That's not even the full, like, paragraph that he's writing about. That's just the end point. And it's just this universe of ideas that's held within that. Uh, mm. Following on from that, uh, like, on the same thing. In present, in the present revolution, the troops protecting the old order are not fighting under the insignia of the ruling class, but under the banner of a social democratic party. So, basically, you know, soldiers, the police, whatever, they're not, they don't see themselves as fighting underneath the ruling, or underneath the ruling class. They see themselves as upholding democracy, which is the lie, mm. the ultimate lie that we are told. The spectacle, part of the spectacle. Which is like, that's two points on the same page that I just came across. <laughs> like, just open up the book randomly, and it's a 125-page mm. book, and the book isn't filled with stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's true. It's 100% true. Yeah. It's definitely like like the way he sort of thinks of postmodern thought, almost. Like, you read stuff from, like, the 19th century that isn't that doesn't really apply today. Like, it applies in, like, a really, like, rudimentary sense. But things have changed mm. so much. Like, especially, like, technology and, like, electricity. Stuff like that didn't exist, like, 100 years ago. Um, or it didn't exist in, like, just the form that it does. So, like, things have changed rapidly in a very short space of time. And there's not a lot of, like, literature on... Or there is, but, like, it isn't as influential uh, on how mm. that sort of changes things. Or, like, our, our body of knowledge. Like, the impact hasn't been sort of absorbed yet. I think... Uh, I think the board is pretty uh, sort of influential in terms of the fact that, like, his situationist sort of ideas, like the situationists, where these guys... Which I don't understand at all. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to sort of 
it's another thing that's like it's it's a really simple idea that's actually really hard to sort of understand or it's like it's it seems more complicated than it is but basically it was like guys in in france in like the the 50s and 60s who like who saw the spectacle and sort of the sort of uh the facade of uh of fakery that sort of permeated uh western liberal democracy and they tried to break that down like they're against the east and the west they're like a st- they were so they were writing at the times of the french uh riots and stuff like that the student riots and stuff yeah like that. that's the thing like the board's writing is like the last sort of western writing that actually had any sort of impact on like real world events or like any sort mm. of revolt like the may 68 riots in paris uh where they nearly o- overthrew the government like charles de gaulle fled france and left germany because at one point it seemed that the government was going to collapse which is like the closest that's that any sort of Western country has come to that. Uh, Which is since insane. World War II. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's such a foreign concept right yeah. now that it's insane. Yeah, that like France would collapse, like the government would cease to exist. Like that nearly happened in '68, and that was based on uh, like a coalition of strikes between students and industry or a union uh, union members in industry in France. And the the students were influenced massively by the Situationists, and uh, it gives you hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it is. It's very. It's like obviously it has some sort of effect. It's obviously pretty pretty smart stuff in there, you know. Uh, but like Situationism is like is weird. Like, like uh, what was the second part of Carl's question? Something about um, can we still have original thought? Can we still have, the second question. Can we still have original thought? No. Well, yes, we can. No, I think we can. But like. Uh, the, the, yeah, I mean, the, ad- adaptations of other ideas. The situation is answers to that is basically reject uh, images or reject representation and go out and create situations, authentic situations uh, out in the world. Like, literally, they used to go for wanders around Paris and they were big into, like, culture jamming and hacking and, like, pranks and stuff like that. Things that would sort of penetrate through the veil of fakery that permeated French society or like Western society or whatever. So yeah, they yeah, did yeah. loads of things that were like subvert the uh the common narrative. And it was pretty original the way they did it, but it has been sort of subverted since then, but that's pretty inevitable. You just have to come up with more original solutions to that, I suppose. Well I mean the problem is that like, you know, capitalism has anticipated uh, the revolution against it and is able to um, counteract it and commodify it. Yeah, foreclose on you know? on all possibilities. But like, like you could say that we could sit here and say that all day, and like we could use it as like justification for doing nothing. But you know, you have to assume there's going to be a, there's some way out. You know, you can only hope. Yeah, you you really can <laughs> only hope. Um, which is a bleak idea. I mean, can we still have original thoughts nowadays? It depends on what you're talking about, I think. I mean, isn't it the whole thing that, like, every story can be boiled down to seven ideas, seven general thoughts? Who said that? I'm pretty sure there's, like, seven basic concepts and every story can be boiled down to that. Yeah, probably, but... Like a str- the stranger walking into town, the journey, and um, there's five others that I can't remember what they are. But there's like general, there's like things that like there's seven of them, and every narrative can be boiled down into that because it's like there's nothing really outside of that that we can think of that is that. Now every everything is an adaptation, and a different interpret in different a different interpretation of that, but you can boil down every film to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, like, we're thinking in terms of, like, what we know. What we know only stretches back as far as what, like, uh, the late 18th century. Like, like Oh, no, even before that. Like, yeah. Look but, at the Iliad. The Iliad and the Odyssey. They're the journey. That's the journey narrative. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we can look at Nightcrawler, which we're talking about earlier on today. As the journey, SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie, as the journey narrative, they're all the same thing because every narrative, you, every character has to like a character has to start somewhere, and go through an arc and end at a different point, 
than what they started at. So therefore, you know, there has to be certain narrative beats to follow. Yeah, well, that's like just a narrative. Like, like that's what we're great at. Like humans, like finding patterns. Like that's what our, you know, that's what that's how we uh, we got to this place in the first place. You know, yes, patterns, finding patterns in random, basically random data, and like, like we talked before about the fact that like the amount of sort of the waste from before, like things that would have been influential if we followed a different path, but instead they're just completely forgotten. Like something like the Iliad yes. definitely applies to the whole journey narrative or whatever, but it like there's probably loads of different stories from before then or like or oh, after yeah. that or at the same time that just don't make any sense to us or don't appeal to us at all. But they don't appeal to us because we've already been we're in within the Iliad tradition, the Iliad timeline or whatever. So Yeah, yeah. Like we yeah, live yeah, in yeah. like an optical society right now. The Iliad that was like a oral society like you have to look and like you know listen to like places that haven't been listened to or haven't been seen and then you'll probably find things that haven't been taught before or different ways of looking at things which is i think is the whole the whole idea i think what you're talking about right there is why foreign language cinema is getting such a uh, like a revival not a revival but like recognition right now mm. like i would say most like american films that i watch i'm like oh yeah that's either good or it's bad i think most foreign language films that i've seen like you know i'd say like half of like you know english language films i've seen i either like or i don't like mm. i'd say the vast majority of foreign language films that i've seen i like because they are so different mm, yeah because they don't they don't have the cultural connotations that like replicate themselves within you know american and you know british cinema you know korean films japanese films french films i mean Fran- france you know is a western culture but you know is a different culture to uh british and american but you know whatever um brazilian films they're all different mm. And it's so interesting to to watch foreign language films because of that reason, because they don't have the cultural things that we're talking about mm. that we're used to. Yeah, especially like like you think of the Western canon, like that's it sort of impacts on Brazil, I suppose. But like stuff like Japan and like China, like they don't they're not really impacted by that. They couldn't give less of a yeah, shit. Yeah, you watch something from there, and there's like it is sort of similar, but there's always going to be something weird in it that you, you've never seen before. Or there's always elements that are, are original to our eyes simply because we've never, because there's a different sort of timeline or a different like lineage, different cultural context to it. Yeah, yeah. Like you're already coming to it as an outsider, and so, and I think especially with horror, I think you know, horror is about alienating you. But when you come to, uh, you know, Japanese or Korean, or Chinese, or Vietnamese, or Taiwanese, whatever. When you come to their horror, you're already an outsider. So whatever is scary, it's just going to alienate you even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you need to find alien movies. Martian movies. Man, I guarantee you those movies are fucked. <laughs> mm. Or, some, so, gonna be or something beyond movies altogether. That's the next step, man. Movies are finished. Cinema is finished. I know this is a movie podcast, basically, but, like, cinema is done, man. Done. You need to find something beyond that, you know? No original ideas. There are no original ideas today. I mean, I think, like, nowadays... I don't know, it depends on the film, but I guess, like, nowadays... Well, it's a terrible time to be thinking, talking about, like, new films, because we're talking about 2020. No new films have really come out. Yeah, it's been a tragic year. Um, but that's why, you know, going back and retroactively looking at films like, you know, Peeping Tom and films like that, yeah, they're, the, they're where the gold and gems the are. Lost the lost lineages, films you, you know? Like, imagine if we... The lost, ti- like, basically the lost timelines of where a film could have gone. Mm, yeah, that's that's the way more interesting way to look at it. Like, imagine we, we lived in a world where Psycho was actually Peeping Tom and we, like, had this sort of, uh, I don't know, not a foreknowledge, but, like, it was more, like complex analysis or a conception of the image rather than just psycho which psycho is a great movie but like it's not it's not as good as people tell is it? i think it is i think it is it? i think it's a good movie it's okay but it's not yeah it's okay it, it's not as good as peep and tom basically so everyone should watch peep and tom is my point um and if you haven't you're fucking 
fraud. You're a garbine. You're a fucking garbine, man. Everyone should watch it. Yeah, I think that's, that's the end of the podcast. That's about it. Um, I think that sums it up. Um. Okay. What film am I gonna go? Yeah, for? That, that's that's the Biden question here. What What's your recommendation for episode fifteen? Um. I am thinking about talking about Funny Game. Now, there are two versions of Funny Game. You can really watch either or because I think that we can talk about both. Yeah, we should. Oh, we should. We should do a double bill: the original and the uh, and the remake. Yeah, you know, we'll definitely talk about both. For those that don't know, Funny Game. Uh, directed by Michelle Haneke, came out in the 1990s. I can't remember exactly when, but he re- he remade the exact same film in 2005 or 2006. Like it's basically the same film, but the meaning behind why he remade it is so interesting that I think like you know maybe watch Funny Games the original one week and then next week watch the one after. But yes, we're going to be talking about both, I think, uh, in two weeks' time. Yeah. I don't know where you can find these films. Yeah, just find this film. It's on YouTube, probably, you know, for rental or get creative, whatever mm. whatever you want to do. Yeah, I was going to talk about that today. Like, I was going to bring that in. Uh, that and Network were, like, the backups in case, like, we didn't have enough uh, to talk about with the other ones. Ah, oh, perfect. This yeah. is a nice... Synergy. It's a it's a little series, yeah, yeah. There's a good synergy in this episode. We're just connected up in these really weird yeah, ways yeah. that we didn't expect. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we will be back next week talking about random films of your whatever we were talking about. Uh, make sure to hit us up on Instagram or Twitter at Paro underscore Pod to give us questions, hot takes, tell us what to do, whatever. We are literally at your bidding. We'll do whatever you want. <laughs> or you can hit us up at uh, email thepowerpod at gmail.com no one's going to email us no one is I don't know that's kind of pointless at this stage like maybe <laughs> please what of our sponsors Mark, do you have any any closing Party thoughts party thoughts uh, just, just remember to stay safe I love it see you all next week bye bye goodbye god bless